it's so different. <laughs> I know. I'm like, Ooh. this is the thing you can't see me dancing as well. Like, yeah, which is kind of lucky for most people, I think. Hello, <laughs> lovely, lovely people. Um, welcome to another session on Orcadmi with myself, Dr. Chloe Farahar, and I am joined today by the wonderful Tanya Adkin. Um, I had to double check because I keep calling you Adkins. I don't know why I want to stick the S on the end. Everybody does it. It's, it's Adkins, Atkin. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah it's Atkin. Atkin. I but forgot to explain, Tanya, that we've, I've started trying to do something to be more accessible in describing my physical appearance. So if, if you okay. don't feel comfortable doing that, obviously, feel free not to. Um, but for those watching, I say I'm Chloe. I am a white woman with a shaved head and giant round glasses. And I am wearing a jumper, one of my favourites, actually, that says current mood potato with a really like sad looking potato <laughs> on his side. And I'm sitting in my office. Uh, and Tanya, if you don't mind. My, yeah, my name is Tanya Adkin. I am a white woman. I have got really dark brown hair, which is piled up on the top of my head in a massive bun because I couldn't be bothered to wash it. <laughs> and I'm wearing a cheetah print top and I'm sat in my office as well. So, yeah, and big glasses. And I like the navy, which is in your, is that your wall? Yeah. It's it's very close to our academy colours. It's lovely. <laughs> I know. I always like fade into the background. Oh, right, it's fantastic. Um, and people saying, oh yeah, right, Roberta saying fab jumper. I know. I love this jumper. Um, it's it's um, a cartoonist or or um, I don't know how they describe themselves, but an illustrator on Instagram, and it's literally just called um, sad potato. But they're not actually sad. They're quite uplifting. So I love it. Oh, see, I wish I'd have worn. I've got a hoodie that says Neurodivergent AF on it with a big infinity symbol. I, w I wish I should have worn that now, shouldn't I? It's no. a bit warm though. Yeah, and that's the thing. I'm, I'm comfy, but it is a bit warm. <laughs> oh, Roberto, I've literally, I'm animal print everything, everywhere. <laughs> Rocking the animal print, nice. Um, <laughs> Hello, lovely, lovely people. I know that many people may be here and we're expecting um, for us to be discussing youth loneliness with um, Andy Smith from Spectrum Gaming. We have had to postpone his appearance um, for personal reasons for his his um, being able to attend, but we will hopefully have him um, on at some point because he is really interesting and the topics that he can discuss. So apologies if you are here for that, but we are discussing, um, so Tanya fantastically was like, I can come on. I was like, oh, thank God, yes, good. We've got somebody to talk to. Um, so what we're discussing actually is autism theories versus autistic theories. Um, so there's a nuance there which we can discuss. And I guess this is really important because what we're really talking about is people's narratives in the literature about why autistic people exist. Why are we here? What makes us autistic? Um, those kinds of things. And so we can have some discussions and Tanya can help pick apart um, some of these theories with me. That's like my favourite thing to do as well, especially if they're old ones. <laughs> Picking them apart. Yes, yeah. exactly. And and my whole, um, well, my not my whole, but I, I really want to be able to educate people in an accessible way. So bringing these theories to people um, that might be behind paywalls or might be behind that really annoying waffly terminology that psychology likes to use, for instance, um, and actually arming people with the knowledge about, well, what are the theories? What do people say about mm -hmm. why autistic people exist? Um, before I we came that, on, Tom. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's where we cross over quite nicely, though, isn't it? Because you're, you're kind of like in academia, um, but also do a bit of work face to face, whereas I'm more like working on the ground, but also do a little bit. Of, so we kind of cross over. So it's nice to kind of put the theories into action and kind of explain how they actually work in a proper face to face environment rather than just reading them and thinking this makes no sense. I don't what, even yeah, read. What, yeah. At the end of the day, what do those theories mean to people who are living every day as autistic people mm. or with families? Um, or loved ones or in a professional capacity you know what do these actually mean and, and mean for our lives I think is quite important um, and yeah absolutely trying to make this knowledge accessible because I think it's that cheesy thing that knowledge is power and it really is I think knowing these things is quite useful yeah well it's useful for relationships with your children yourself your community if you understand why we are who we are 
then the rest of it just kind of falls into place. And I think I had this post up the other day about parenting courses. And, you know, we can often we go into schools or I go into schools and they're like strategy for this strategy for that strategy for the other. But if you have a 30 minute conversation with them and explain the why's underneath it, you don't need strategies because yeah. you just naturally get into it. Put in the not like you say, put in the knowledge into practice. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the difficulty, isn't it? And certainly probably more for your from your perspective is that yeah. you're potentially dealing with people who really don't understand autistic experience. Yeah. And the worst part of that is, is these people have the professional hat as well. So they probably did their training in the 90s or whatever, which, are, you know, there are a lot of problematic theories in the 80s and 90s. And because they've kind of got this professional shield, many parents and so on, they want to learn. They're open to learning and they're open to having like, you know, looking at the different stereotypes and the bias and the bias in research. But when somebody's there with a professional hat on, it's really difficult to kind of get past that. And get them to actually see you might not be right and you might yeah. actually have the wrong idea about autism and what you've read or learnt is now 20 or 30 years out yeah. of date. Yeah. Um, Especially as an autistic woman sat there telling them that probably is, I don't know, a little bit younger than them as well. That's really difficult. And I think really importantly, I'm going to give everyone, it's a spoiler, but the answer is we don't actually know why autistic people exist other than two people who loved each other somewhat decided to have a child and then that child ended up being autistic. Um, you know, we can talk about evolutionary theories and things like that, but when I'm not going into those today. But like I say, it's a spoiler. We don't actually know. We don't know why we're here. We don't know why we're autistic or what makes us autistic. So all we've got are two types of theories. We've got outsiders looking at autistic people theories. So they, those tend to be the autism theories, this abstract thing called autism. And then we've got, I would say at this point in time, two key um, autistic theories that are led by autistic people who are um, also researchers and things. So they're kind of the two theories that we would compare. I was thinking about this before we came on as well. And kind of the thing is as well, is it Christy Forbes that actually um, compares neurodiversity to biodiversity quite a lot? Possibly. I mean, that that was the original, even in the like, yeah, 1995 when Judy Singer was yeah, talking yeah. about it. Yeah. But if we look at the kind of like animals, we look at biodiversity, everything exists for a reason. And if we look at the kind of old kind of autism theories, it's looking at deficit. Whereas we look at the new ones, we're actually looking at, OK, what are the strengths? Why did why are we here? What are we good at? Or at least being balanced. This is my whole yeah. argument is that nothing, no theories tend to be balanced. Um, and that makes them quite problematic as well. Yeah. Um, so I have got slides because I do love a good slide, um, but it's not too for, for the people that are watching and things like that. It's not necessarily that you need to concentrate on these. It's just to help remind me as well, because there's actually a number of theories um, and things like that. So let's see if I can pop that all on screen. Screen two. There's us. Nice and small. Um, so, yes, theories of autism this abstract concept called autism versus autistic theories of autistic experience um which i would argue is a bit more humanizing um than the outsider looking at autistic people um theories okay so we've got neurotypical derived so non-autistic people creating theories about what it means uh, or what autism is so again I'm trying to explain or make it clear, they're not necessarily talking about autistic people. They're talking about this concept, this construct called autism. Um, and so this is neurotypical theories of autism and their criticism. So why are there autistic people? I do love a good PowerPoint. Um, so this is a clinical definition of autism in the abstract. So autism, and this is me writing, I usually, um, 
when I'm whether whenever I'm writing a chapter or something, I will preface it with this autism as an abstract concept. I want to be quite clear, it's abstract is defined as a persistent impairment in reciprocal social communication and interaction, restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, interest or activities, all of which may relate to hyper reactivity, which is avoidance or hypo reactivity, sense seeking to sensory input. And then it states with or without accompanying intellectual disability and or language impairment. Um, to be clear, in the UK, we refer to it as learning disability, but this is an American uh, diagnostic manual and we do use it quite readily in the UK. So that's um, all deficit. I was going to say thoughts? that's a lovely little, uh, lovely little ray of sunshine that, isn't it? Well, I mean, and the thing is the chapter on autism is actually quite long in the manual. Um, so if you are you know, particularly bored, there is a two hour video of, of me going through the whole manual. So you've got that knowledge. Um, but this is just to demonstrate uh, this is the International Classification of Diseases. Um, so the World Health Organization um, stating the different codes relating to which diagnosis you might get um, and whether you have also, again, either a learning disability and or language impairment and so on. And then the top one is the uh, DSM. So just to demonstrate, I'm not making it up. Um, so yeah, there's there is a video of us going through the video, but it's nearly two hours long going through the chapter. So I don't recommend that if you, <laughs> unless you really are uh, somewhat masochistic. I think that's the word. Um, so in terms of the neurotypical theories of this abstract idea of autism, then so I don't want to give loads of detail. I, I'd quite like to have a discussion with Tanya about them. So there are some of them that are interrelated theories, but psychologists and so on. They we I say they but not necessarily me per se, even though I am a psychologist, um, really want to come up with the definitive answer, this nice little um, simple idea that will explain actually something quite complex, i.e. autistic people and their experiences. But a lot of the theories do interrelate in some way. So usually someone will come up with a theory and then lots of people will pick holes in it and go, well, that doesn't explain this and it doesn't explain that. So somebody else will come up with another theory that might try and fill in that gap um, so you can see how they kind of interrelate. So you've got the behavioral um, theory about what is autism. Um, basically, that is the diagnostic checklist. So there's not much more to it than that. It's the observation of behaviors of people, which clearly ignores what it feels like on the inside, what are we thinking, how are we processing information. It is purely looking at behavior. Um, so, like I say, we've already discussed that by dis, um, outlining the observable behaviour diagnostic checklist. Any thoughts? <laughs> I mean, it's massively outdated, isn't it, the DSM-5? And I think that when we're looking at things like fixed and repetitive interest, the problem is with the diagnostician as well, is that they're only as good as their training or their own knowledge or their own exposure and then there are other things as well that, you know, that's going on in the NHS where we're over diagnosing and that kind of stuff. So realistically, I mean, I was thinking about this today as well, because, um, you know, we know quite a lot of late diagnosed autistic people. So realistically, what you're doing is you're going to this person who's got some letters after the name, but it's based on their opinion of a very loose kind of yeah, some people still argue against self-identifying. It doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> and 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 that's exactly right. So, I mean, obviously, we could go into a whole discussion, which we won't necessarily have time to today, about masked autistic presentation. So, mm -hmm. like I say, that's clearly a problem if all we are basing this idea of autism on is behavioural, observable and when we get into the other theories as well, it's all the behaviour and obser observations have been based on a very small set of criteria. Yep. So yep. there's all the bias and everything in there as well. And, th and that's what you and I will have discussed before and a number yeah. of other autistic people have discussed is the issue with the checklist, this behavioural uh, theory of autism is we would argue a lot of it is based on watching a struggling autistic person in distress. That's trauma. Yeah. And that we actually have lots of other behaviours that aren't distressed behaviours, but they are autistic. We also have lots of masked behaviours. We have lots of things that go on inside. You know, um, 
I that a lot of what I've learned about my autistic self has come from the community. It doesn't come from the literature. It doesn't come from diagnosticians, which actually gave me more questions than answers when I got my diagnosis. I was like, you haven't told me anything. You haven't actually explained me to yeah, myself. There isn't an explanation, I think. It's, it depends on individual experience as well. And I've yet to meet an autistic person that is just autistic. I mean, we've got all the co-occurring differences in there as well. Um, as but well as sexism, racism, everything else that kind of feeds into it. I'm going to put up Andrew's comment, but not for us to answer right now, Andrew, but okay. because it's actually quite relevant to what you've just described, which is that there's too much overlap because no human being fits into the nice, neat boxes that psychology, psychologists, diagnosticians and so on want us to fit into because we're human beings um and it's much more complicated than that um i guess what i was also trying to get at was that i've learned about burnout i didn't learn that from you know non-autistic people i learned that from the community and that has been one of the biggest things to help me understand myself mm -hmm. um i learned we all have heard of or, or largely I, I would say most people have heard of echolalia our autistic uh, need to regulate or even just out of enjoyment the repetition of words sounds or phrases right um, but that doesn't I only learned from the community echolasia where we do exactly the same thing but it's in your head Inside, yeah right that can't be on this theory yeah. this behavioral theory unless you talk to autistic people and get us to actually I think the you. community actually teach you how to be autistic in a way yeah um i mean authentically like yourself yeah. yeah energy management is a massive one for me literally i think one of the most or you know because i think i'm about five nearly six years in now like literally the way that i've changed in the past nearly six years is everything that i do now has to be based on energy it's energy versus payoff um you know and that's a really effective but that is it's a culturally autistic thing or or even if people like with the spoons theory as well anybody that has kind of illness or disability uses that as well um but yeah burnout different forms of masking what masking can look like you know but i suppose it's again which we'll go into it's polytropic versus monotropic thinking isn't it and it's the deep dive so anybody can say echolalia, yeah. anybody can say masking and that's all we see it's kind of like face off but actually it's the autistic community that have really kind of shown the different examples of that and the variability and yeah and i think so many of the things are linked but they're discussed as if they're separate things so you know this the discussion on masking in the literature which is um, inaccurately referred to as camouflaging and does not take into account it's really not this conscious decision in social situations to mask it's it's very much an unconscious survival mechanism and so on but all oh, the things you yeah. kind of talked about there that that would be a whole discussion another session on its own which yeah. is like you say once you start working with supporting interacting on an equitable footing within our own autistic community you start to learn how all these things are linked so you know our autistic sensory needs um, and needs in general social emotional and, and sensory needs mm -hmm. then when you when you've learned those about yourself via the community and interacting you can then put in boundaries and so on you can work out your masking that means if you're put your work recognizing your needs putting in boundaries asking for accommodations um, masking if you do it it's in your control and not in control of you which is something Kieran made me really aware of is an important thing to understand that it's not always safe or comfortable to just completely drop your mask and it's not always something that somebody can do either it's not even some it's not necessarily something you know that um i think i did a post it's either going to be it was today actually about um to late diagnose people often come to me and they go you know how do i be autistic how do i unmask how and that's kind of a bit of a myth because if you've been doing it for so long you're not going to know what is and isn't i yeah. think yeah um, but you're right, it all kind of just melts into one because what you see is all in the community, it's all around you and it's in yourself. Um, and, and but then, and then going back to your point, which is about you end up for you, and I would actually argue probably for me as well, the biggest thing 
that I've learned and the biggest, um, I guess, tools or skills or whatever it is you want, however you want to describe it, that I've learned about myself is masking boundaries. Boundaries is so, so important because when you've, again, if you understand your needs as an autistic person, you can then put in boundaries, i.e. I can't do that thing. I won't do that thing. Um, I need to do this thing, you know, putting in your boundaries to respect your needs. And then that will help you with your energy accounting, with yes. your burnout, because you're respecting your autistic need and, mm -hmm. and feeling capable of asserting that need is a really huge thing that a number of people like yourself in different programs and things that you've done. And I know that other autistic people do, which is teaching us self-advocacy. Yeah. Yeah. Which is huge. I don't know about you as well, but whenever I start working with like a newly identified adult or a young person, the first place that I always go to is getting back in the senses, like reconnecting with the senses. Because like you said, once you understand that and then you can go on to energy accounting, once you understand energy and senses and what gives you energy and what takes that away, you start to just know yourself and marry up that kind of, especially if there's been trauma, you know, because then there's likely to be alexithymia, if there's been burnout, it just marries that back up. I don't know how it does it, it just does. Well, like I said, they're just also linked, but within the theories of autism, yeah. the abstract concept, that there's none of that matching things up. It There's none of that understanding from the inside out. And no. I'm just thinking, I've got a number of slides and we're still on the like the second slide. And I, I think I'm going to get stuck into these way too much, um, okay. which won't. But that's not your that's not your problem. That's my time management problem. Um, so that's the behavioral like theory. It's not much of a theory, really, other than observing behaviors of people and then collating them and saying these ones happen the most for these this group of people, we're going to call it autism. Um, then you've got the biological theories, and, and all of these theories have flaws. Um, all of them have criticisms. Um, so the biological theories would be things like candidate neuro neurology that have been indicated. Now, what's really important about this, um, so Tanya and I kind of have a quick discussion before actually we came on, um, is that we can start to talk about with anything, including the shape of my nose that there is a genetic marker that says what shape my nose should be or what eye color I should have and so on so there are to some extent candidate potential um, neurological things going on in the brain right um, that have kind of been found across different autistic people in a similar way in a similar pattern if that makes sense but what's really important is that at this point in time, they are not causative. So that means that just because somebody might have that particular neurological pattern, they don't necessarily end up being autistic, which makes the theory of that particular theory of candidate neurology flawed, because it has to be singular <laughs> to one experience, i.e. being autistic. If it happens for non-autistic people too, it's not a good enough theory. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, I can get like a one-to-one -one here. It's great. <laughs> yeah, we forget that there's other people here. I should, just, um, I should take notes, shouldn't I? <laughs> well, I mean, you've got you've got the recording now as well. So, um, so, so basically what I've got there is that there's so-called abnormal. Um, actually, to be clear, neuroscientists will state themselves there's no such thing as a normal brain. Um, although if we're then talking about, say, a brain a person who gets into a car accident and it damages the brain, that's different. What we're talking about is if you are born with a particular neurology, it is um, neuroscientifically so, neither good nor bad. There's no blueprint for the perfect brain. So this idea of abnormal brain structures, what that means is just, they, these people have behaviors we don't particularly like in society. If they have brain things or genetic things going on that match up with their behavior, that must be the genes or the brain that we don't like. Does that make sense? So there's no inherent right or wrong when it comes to genes or neurology. It depends on whether we like the behaviors. There is a massive problem with looking for the genes, though. Mm. Huge. Yes. <laughs> yes, which we won't go into too much detail, but we, yeah. Um, we had this discussion, yeah. didn't we, which is that um, while some of us might want to know 
genetically where is the gene for autism so at this point we don't we don't know the genes for autism they think um, it's quite a lot don't they they think it's a, a lot of different factors kind of which then just means it's just a human it's just yeah. a, it's just a human which being just means they don't know <laughs> yes that too yeah. um, because, and i because i use this when i discuss things like um psychosis mm. so for years they tried to look for the psychotic gene or the schizophrenic gene in quotation marks and never found one um and that there's there's over a thousand genetic markers that have been linked to possibly this thing called schizophrenia the problem with that is that not everyone who experiences psychosis will have all of those genetic differences or genetic markers and a thousand genetic markers is literally just a, a brain doing brain things because we're only we only have around and I may get this right I think it's around thirty four thousand genes in the human genome or have I given us too many? I potentially given us too many genes. Let me just double check how many genes in the human genome. So it sounds so, to me then like it's just somebody justifying their own job. <laughs> if that's just the body doing body things. Exactly. Um, no, I've definitely given us way too many genes. We have around. Um, each human being will have around 20 to 25,000 genes that make up the human genome. So there's not actually that much information that makes us us. If you look at it that way, like that probably doesn't sound like yeah. a lot of genes, really. Um, so if you've got a thousand that are indicating something, that's not really indicating disorder or anything. It's just it's, it's just genes doing the gene thing yeah they're being complex it's basically all those different genes come together and you get a particular presentation of a human being right um so the issue with this looking for abnormal brain structures or function within within the brains of autistic people um and that there's been signs of maybe gray matter that might be different now the issue with a lot of this is actually learning its environment you know our brains will change over a course of a lifetime that can change on what's the word for that is it neuroplasticity is that yes. right yes. <laughs> Neuro <laughs> yes. so fantastic so neuroplasticity um i always get stuck with the word plastic because it makes me think think something's rigid but what no, it means is moldable. Yes, i always mean plasticine plasticine okay i then have to imagine molds and plastic um but yeah it, it literally as you say um plasticity means moldable um and so yes human beings our brains are moldable so that's why you've got taxi drivers in london who do the knowledge you know where they learn all the roads they have a larger part of the brain that relates to um like maps and oh the direction the stuff that i can't do directions directions and, and things yeah. yeah so they have a they have a larger brain part in relation to that because they learnt and it actually affected their neurology right but considering that we are sensorily different anyway and the, the amount of information that we take in is much greater from a sensory perspective just from a sensory perspective and that we culturally have different communication because of that of course, the brain's going to be different. So why are they spending all that money on this? Because that's if they just find the jobs again. I mean, this is the thing. A lot of autistic people keep saying that our 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 expectations, our desires for research into being autistic and so on is about how do we reduce the higher rates of suicidality in our community? How do we um, help autistic people who also have like say some certain physical disabilities or the higher rates of epilepsy um you know those things we're more interested in those yeah. things being how recent. do we level the playing field well, you know is there a particular way that we learn better is there a particular all those things that are actually useful <laughs> yeah i'm i'm i do apologize i am ignoring the comment section so um i'm just gonna if um so i thinks there's anything really um, that we should answer, uh, please let me know and flag it, Sai, um, in case we need to explain something that we've not explained too well or something along those lines, because um, there's some fantastic conversations going on in the comment section and I don't want to yeah. um, miss anything. Um, so basically, yes, there have been potentially some so-called abnormal, in quotation marks, brain structures or atypical grey matter, so like the, the squishy grey matter of the brain. But the problem is that one autistic person's brain is as different to another autistic person's brain 
as to a neurotypical and another neurotypical because every single brain, every single human brain is different. And so that's, that's not reliable then, basically. Yeah. It's and that's neurodiversity. Yes. <laughs> and that's like, yes, yeah, so that's neurodiversity. Um, and so you can't really use that as a, it's not a nice clear cut um, indicator. And the thing, sometimes people will say, you know, you know, well, we can keep looking and this, that and the other. And my whole argument is even if we were, which some people struggle with this concept, but even if we were to find the gene or the neurological correlates so that the, the part of how the brain is structured in a particular way for autistic people for instance so the genes the biomarkers the neurology even if we were to find the autism something that still does not give us proof of disorder and so right. a lot of people really struggle with that idea because they're like but you're look, you found it and it's like, but the only thing that determines whether that gene and the consequent presentation, i.e. autism, um, the only thing that just sort of decides whether that's disorder is society, right? So and there's there are no the problems with that. <laughs> yeah. So there's no inherent right or wrong when it comes to um, genes. So basically so disorder in itself is a bit of an abstract concept. It, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um and, and like I say, it does get very confusing and complicated. Um, so um, this was a really quite a good paper. So Pua, Pua et al. in 2017, they did like a, a big study where they looked at lots of studies, right? So it's called a meta-analysis. So they didn't just do one study, they actually combined lots of studies. Um, and they, looking at the so-called biomarkers and neuroimaging across all these different studies that had tried to find autism in the brain, there was no definitive marker across all these different studies right but yeah i'm just sat here thinking that sounds like a massive waste of money and scientific brain power when we could actually be assisting people to be honest yeah. maybe that's just how much that money could go into making schools more accessible making employment more anything, accessible training yeah. anything this is true this is very true um and i think this is basically what i've just described so um again this is in quotation marks because this isn't my terminology because i don't use this terminology so autism spectrum disorder research has discovered many varied early behaviors and varied brain markers but there's no consistent predictor pattern found so that in itself the fact that they've discovered many varied early behaviors just completely poo-poo's the dsm5 anyway because it's based on three. Yeah, this is true. Yeah, and 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 again, Nobody yeah, you can agree what they're doing. Listen to autistic people. The end. <laughs> you can really pick apart so many of these theories quite quite quickly. Yeah. Um, even if you don't have a particular, you know, you don't have to be an academic. And and I don't, you know, this page. I know I'm an academic and so on. But the whole point is to bring this knowledge in an accessible way for people to understand. Because I think you can all do well at picking it apart yourselves as yeah. well um now we're going to get onto this i don't want to stay too long on this but let's talk about vaccine theory okay oh. it's not even really a theory i want to be quite clear because okay right let's explain so this is a biological theory it falls under the biological theories so vaccine theory has been debunked that means that um it's been proven that it was wrong OK, so that's what debunked means. And also the original paper that people will quote, which is Wakefield et al., it's actually a, a number of authors, was retracted because it was found that um, they'd fudged their data, that they'd made up data. And um, they happened to be paid by a particular pharmaceutical company, didn't they, to deliver that paper? Yes. Yeah. So lots of methodological, i.e. the methods that they used in their study were really poor, which I'm going to explain. I'm giving you this knowledge. I really don't ever suggest getting into arguments or debates with anti-vaxxers. It is not worth your time or resources. Save the Some, spoons. Yeah. Save your spoons for people who actually want to learn um, and want to learn a new narrative. And what I've learned over the years is that some of us, will hold on to certain narratives and it will be for lots of personal reasons um that is obviously problematic we've got fantastic activists who will fight against harmful uh, quack cures in quotation marks and things like that but what i mean is on that daily basis if you you know 
it's probably not worth your time getting involved in an argument online with somebody um, mm -hmm. because they will be cherry picking and, and so on what they want to believe. So that's not why I'm giving you this information. I'm giving it for your own personal understanding, I guess. So the paper, the original paper that started the whole issue and controversy was the Wakefield et al, because it was a lot of authors in 98, which was retracted. I have actually read the retracted paper. I doubt that very many people who claim, you know, that are anti-vax and so on have actually read it. So let's talk about what it actually did and said. And I think that will help you understand why it's debunked and problematic, other than the fact they fudged stuff. I'm glad that I don't have to read it and you've done it for me. <laughs> I've done it for you, yeah. Um, now, think about this, even if you've never done any research in psychology, about the methodology that they used here, the research method. They had 12 children, <laughs> red flag already, just 12, 12 children, um, who were a mean age of six. So that's what the M stands for. So they were around six years, but they ranged between three and 10 years old. There were 11 boys. Okay, so we're already problematic there as well. They didn't have a control condition. So they literally just looked at the children that were described as having a certain syndrome. Now, really importantly, this paper never refers to autism. It just keeps describing a syndrome and describes what we would class at that point in time as autism. So they don't actually make a link between autism and vaccines. That's really wimpish, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to do it, at least do it properly. <laughs> Maybe that's Very... like hand avoidance in me, but I just think that's really passive aggressive. Uh, yeah, so Roberta, oof, 12 children, massive sample size, and then a laugh because they're being um, sarcastic. Um, so yes, so 12 children, uh, there was no control. So they didn't compare it to non-autistic children. Um, they didn't do a statistical analysis. OK, they didn't look they only did correlation. So what that means is that they didn't manipulate anything. They didn't look at a control condition. They literally just looked at outcomes, behaviours and so on, and whether those children had experienced the vaccine or had the vaccine. Right? Were these people scientists or politicians? <laughs> well, given Wakefield is no longer allowed to practice. Um, but yeah, so it's obviously a very, very small sample size. So that's that's part of the issue with methodology. So this is directly from the paper. They talk about the onset of behavioral symptoms were associated, now again, association means they didn't actually do a proper study. What they did was they um, correlated, they looked at a link and link, if you've even know anything sort of on basics of correlation is that links do not equal causation so we can't say one caused the other and it might actually be something completely different that they've not even considered that is linked who decides what a link is though who decides what a viable link is well that Politics. would be well yeah that would be making a decision about what you're even studying and you yeah. can if you go to there's a really funny um website that's about nonsense correlations and there's like you can correlate so link as one goes up, the other goes up. Um, the number or the year, sorry, of Nicolas Cage films yeah. and something like ice cream sales or something like that. It's like really random because links like those, um, they happen all the time, but they, they really have nothing to do with one another. You call that coincidence, yeah. It's coincidence, basically, as well. So onset behavioural symptoms was associated, according to the parents, with the vaccination in eight of 12 children with measles infection in one child and otitis media in another. Or titis, I'm probably pronouncing that completely wrong. So importantly, what they actually did in this study, if you can even call it that, it shouldn't have even passed an ethics board, if I'm honest, um, is they asked the parents to recall over the phone just a history of their child. Now, given that one of these, at least one of the children, because the age range was 10, they're trying to retroactively look into the past and get the parent to describe that, that child's upbringing. So now we're basing this on memory of parents. OK, we're not basing this on observable, measurable. Anything. I have to think twice about my kid's date of birth. So. <laughs> right. So you can see that they felt the parents felt that there was an association 
with eight of the 12 children. And also, that, what's the question in mind there? Because if you've got a child that has high support needs and the real awful stereotypes that are surrounding, you know, autism and all the damaging theories and stuff, if you potentially lead a parent to think that you've got an answer for it and that it's somebody's fault and that there is potential suing in the line, then, of course, they're going to go, oh, yeah, it was definitely that. Yeah. And somebody saying, why Why are people still going on about it? Why are people still going on about this fact stuff? And it, exactly. And the problem as well is that they're basing it on an incredibly flawed paper. And I haven't even got to the best bit. Okay, <laughs> So I'm going to get to the best bit in a second. So at this point, this was a 2019 um, paper. So one of the I think there's been another one since hit, hit, since this one. Um, which was a huge study that found absolutely no link between um, aut being autistic and uh, the vaccination. So here, this particular paper, they followed 650,000 children, not 12, 650,000 Danish children until they were on average eight years old. This was a proper study. And the researchers found around 1% of them were autistic, right? Is that where the 1% figure comes from? Potentially. And obviously, this um, it dependent on how long they'd been doing this study because they were following them for a long time. Um, so that could have obviously changed with our understanding of what autistic experience looks like now. Um, mm -hmm. So even if that's, that's obviously a conservative estimate um, of the number of children that were probably autistic. So most children in the study had received the MMR vaccine and there was no difference in the rates of autism between those who'd been vaccinated and those who had not. So basically, you know, lovely, huge study didn't find a link between autism and the vaccination. The other interesting thing about this as well is if we look at, um, you know, because he he was talking basically about what what is known as autistic regression that they mm -hmm. say happens at about age three, which three or four, which is when this, um, you know, when the vaccine happens, basically. But what else happens around that age is children are picked up from their lovely little homes and popped into preschool. So if they struggle with processing that and they're traumatized from a sense and they hit burnout or regression as was known and lose skills there you go cause what is it causation doesn't mean was well, it correlation doesn't mean causation yeah yeah That's the one. Yeah. yeah there's no cause and effect yeah okay. uh, it just happens around the same time and so this like, like I say this lovely huge study um you know didn't find that link I still haven't got to the best bit um oh hold on uh, so this was just a, a, an infographic that basically also says the same sort of thing so um it wasn't based on statistics there was no control group it relied on people's memories over the phone talking to parents um this was as of 2012 a review let me zoom in actually because that's quite small for people hold on so a review, so in 2012, a review of 27 cohort studies, so that's 27 studies. So like I said, you can look at one study, like that one had 650,000 children in it. This particular review was looking at 27 studies, which could have included a really, really big group like that one study. Um, so it had 17 case control studies, six self-controlled, so lots of studies, basically. They looked at lots of studies. Um, basically, at that point, with all those studies together, that was over 14,700,000 children that had been included in studies looking at, is there a link between vaccines <clears throat> and autism? That is a lot of participants. Um, and they still, with all of that, found no correlation, not a tiny correlation, not a really small correlation, but none whatsoever. Zilch, okay. uh, nothing. Nothing. Um, obviously, the problems that we've had with um, with that is the issues with rises and things that we shouldn't have seen rises in because people not getting vaccinated and so on. But I, we don't need to go into that particularly at this point. Basically, this is, they should have them up on manslaughter, really, at least. <laughs> lots of... In my lots. opinion. <laughs> oh, no, where's my little... Oh, no, it's not even there. OK, usually there's a pop-up. I don't know where it's gone. There's usually a little screenshot that I have from the paper that's actually the, the icing on the cake when it comes to that original wake, Wakefield paper. Like I said, I didn't really want to make this about, a vac <laughs> about vaccines, but still. Um, 
And what it what's really important is in their discussion section in that retracted paper from 1998, they state they did not find a correlation between the vaccine and the syndrome described and that they would need more research to be carried out to see if they could find a, a correlation so by not getting... not even did he not say the word autism, but he also said that they didn't actually find a correlation and it still got struck off and it still got retracted. He really because wasn't was... right on though. Yeah. But, it's, but people have jumped on it, even though, because there was, there was just, it was mentioned and that was enough for people to jump on it because people mm. want answers and I understand that. Um, but that, but again, the one. <laughs> to the narrative of, you know, seeing autistic experience in a very negative way. Okay. Um, this so so this is where I'm now going into genetics and heritability. So I like to try and make this quite clear for people, because some people get confused that sometimes we can talk about genetics. So that's the, you know, the genetic information that's coded into your DNA and so on. And we can talk about but that doesn't just because you might find genetics doesn't necessarily mean that you find the biomarkers, i.e. the thing that's going on in the brain and that kind of thing. So people sometimes get confused that while we might know that something's um, inherited or likely that if you've got parents or a parent who's autistic, there's a statistical likelihood. So this is all based on statistics and numbers, statistical likelihood that the children will be autistic, too. So we can have a statistical estimate of heritability about you inheriting, but we don't know what is inherited. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's all based on the numbers game. This person's autistic, the statistical likelihood of being or having children that are autistic is not the same as knowing what is being passed on, what genetic yeah. information, what neurological information and so on and so forth so just to be clear because some people get confused so we don't know what it is but we do know that it passes down and this yes. is statistics on that yeah so it's just about that statistics bit and the reason i try to explain that is because i've had parents who get frustrated when um say a diagnostician or somebody might, might say to them uh well, look into your family because it's it's heritable and things like that. And there's me saying, but there's no genetic marker and we can't actually tell you who is autistic by looking at their genes and so on. So just to try and explain that part and pick it apart. Um, so in the DSM-5, so this is the uh, pay, uh, the di um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the recent edition, 5, was published in 2013, which means it would have taken a long time before that to get all the information together to put in that manual. So we're already talking about an old estimate. It, it was okay. already outdated then before it was even published. Most books are, actually. Anything that's research-based is usually out of date because of the amount of time it takes to publish something. Um, so we're basing this on... on old data if you like so here in the dsm it talks about heritability estimates the estimate that the likelihood that you will um be autistic basically so heritability est heritability estimates for autism range from 37 percent to 90 percent i'm going to talk about why there's such a big huge gap there so the likelihood based on twin concordance rates so what this means is they've looked at some studies um, where one twin, one of, a, one of a set of twins is autistic. What is the likelihood, the percentage likelihood that the other twin will also be autistic? Because if both of them are autistic, and we see this all the time with twins that are sharing 100% DNA, so they are monozygotic twins, they are um, uh, identical twins. Yeah, they're identical twins. So um, you've got dizzy zygotic, um, which means that they are two separate eggs um, and they aren't identical twins. So they would have a lower, um, they won't have the same. Uh, two separate genetic. eggs, same oven, same egg, split into <laughs> two, same oven. Gotcha. Fantastic, yeah. So what they're talking about here is if you've got twins that share 100% of their DNA, or it's, I mean, it's never quite 100% actually, which is quite interesting, um, but they share 100% of the DNA. Um, what is the percentage likelihood that both will be autistic? And the range is dependent on the studies that they looked at is some studies said it's a 37% likelihood that both will be autistic. And other studies 
have said up to 90% likelihood. But considering that the diagnostic criteria is so crap because it's just been disproved with some other studies that didn't bloody work, that there are a range of behaviours, we're still stuck at we don't know. Yeah. So listen to autistics the end. <laughs> so the reason we see this massive disparity is because this is usually these kinds of studies where they look at twins, for instance, or family and adoption studies and things like that, is they actually very, very rarely look at genetic information or neurological information in the brain mm. and so on. What they are doing is just going, this one appears to be autistic based on the behavioral checklist. This other twin appears to be autistic or not autistic based on that checklist. What is the percentage, right? There's no looking. And we see this a lot as well. So if you've got one child that externalizes more, um, mm -hmm. it's often like people don't sorry that's my son shouting he's fighting with his brother <laughs> but they um but you know they it's confirmation bias isn't it so they look at one child and but what they don't realize is that every single autistic person is different and can present differently like we were saying before masked and yeah masked, less observable yeah, different yeah. co-occurring differences that you know maybe maybe in a caring capacity all sorts of different things so problematic here with the with the um, heritability estimates then. Um, then let's explain this bit. So as many as 15% of cases of autism appear to be associated. So we're back to when they when you see the word associated, linked, and so on, they mean correlation. That's a that that like we said, that non-cause and effect type of statistical analysis. Um, so it appears to be associated with a known genetic mutation. Now, what is important apart from the fact only 15% appear to be connected, it should be 100%. If you found the gene, it would be 100% all the time. Okay? Well, what do, so, because I'm law, what does the word associated, what's the definition, what are the parameters for associated? So like I say, because I know they're talking in terms of statistics, yeah, it does mean correlation. It okay. means um, it's, it's, uh, you've got two data sets, and you can have two outcomes. Well, actually, you can have multiple outcomes. But usually what you're looking at is if one number goes up, the other number also goes up at a, same, at a similar rate. Oh, OK. Ooh. So like Nick Cage and ice cream, yeah? Yep. Got yep. it. Um, or you can have what's known as a negative correlation, which is where one thing goes up, the other goes down. But it really depends on how you're looking at things. But yeah, Basically, whenever you... what you want in is work in the way in which you want it to do. <laughs> In, oh well in terms of yeah. what you're looking for yeah, yeah um yeah. and and um, obviously this is not a statistics lecture um at all but it gets slightly more interesting i guess or complicated is that you can have um a significant correlation i.e um statistically speaking it looks correct that 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 what you found is actually what you found does that make sense like yeah, it's yeah. significant but you can also have um different effect sizes so it could be a really small correlation like really teeny tiny and actually there must be loads of other information that's not been looked at that's actually explaining the outcome or it could it's be not, it's not far off politics is it <laughs> <laughs> oh what statistics yeah, yeah. so i keep um, making me laugh in the comments oh okay i've ignored it so <laughs> There's a tree out there providing oxygen for these people. They need to go and find it and apologise to it. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so now, so let's explain this bit then. So we've talked, so we've mentioned about the heritability, the likelihood, the statistical likelihood that you will be autistic if a family member, particularly a twin, is autistic. Um, and now we're, what we're talking about here is there's other studies that have looked at as many as 15% of autistic um, people that they've measured anyway obviously they can't measure all autistic people, um, appear to, so 15% of cases of autism appear to be correlated with a known, so i.e. they're autistic, there's 15% of autistic people where they also seem to have this genetic mutation. That's only 15% though, I say it's only... Well, would that not be the same in neurotypicals, one would think? Right, right, yes, fantastic. See, <laughs> you're on your way to doing your master's. Um, so, Woo! however... 
even when autism is associated with a known genetic mutation, it does not appear to be fully penetrant. Now, let me explain that because I've taken that verbatim from the manual. So let's explain what they mean here. So what they mean by saying it's not necessarily fully penetrant, that gene, um, not fully producing characteristic effects in the phenotypes of individuals possessing it. Let's break that down. Basically, having the gene this that they found that in some cases, 15% of cases is related to autism, Basically, having that gene doesn't mean someone will be autistic. So like so, you said, there could be neurotypical people with that gene who don't end up being autistic. So basically, they've just wasted a whole heap more money that could be better spent in supporting autistic people or training on not finding anything. Basically, we don't do too well. Like so for me, scientifically, I don't find it interesting to know where or what gene and yeah. so on. Um, so the risk, again, this isn't my wording because it's verbatim. So the risk of the remainder of cases for people being autistic appears to be polygenic. That means lots of genes, lots of genetic markers, not one, um, with perhaps hundreds of genetic loci um, making relatively small contributions. So there might be lots of things that make up being autistic and they're being contributed by lots of genes not one but we still don't know <laughs> oh Rowan's crying oh dear how do I mute me I'm gone a minute I can do that for you for a minute if you want yeah, that's helpful please. okay there we go um obviously bring yourself back on when you feel when, when you feel capable um so now let's move on to then so we've done behavioral which is just the checklist we've talked about some of the possible biological discussions so heritability estimates genetic um uh, loci that actually there really isn't anything demonstrating uh, a single genetic um predisposition if you like um so now we're on to the cognitive so the how we think so we've now got theories that are claiming certain ways of cognating of, of brains thinking um, relates to being autistic so these are cognitive theories so this is all about these primary deficit models um, some of you may know this this name on the screen which is um, Sasha Baron Cohen's cousin uh, Simon Baron Cohen so um, Simon came up with the theory not our lovely Sai uh, this is Simon Baron Cohen um, came up with a theory of mind theory um, there's actually a new paper out on um, debunking his theory of mind, but we're going to mention it because it's still being discussed in training with professionals and so on. Um, and it's really problematic. It was already flawed and criticised quite heavily, but we actually have recent papers that debunk it that say it's incredibly flawed enough that it's not a good theory in any respect. OK, so what the theory of mind theory is basically stating is that human beings um, should get to a developmental stage as young people, as children, where they can start to theorise what another person is thinking and be relatively accurate at working that stuff out. It's called perspective taking, basically. But can we theorise what that other person is thinking? Now, even before the papers that tried to debunk this or have debunked the theory, there was always problems because lots of autistic people are actually really good at theorising what non-autistic people and other autistic people are thinking. Um, and what was also um, put a nail in the coffin for this theory is lots of non-autistic people, neurotypical people, are actually quite poor at theorising other people's minds. OK, so this is where they came up with what they called learned theory of mind, which I always find absolutely ironic. Is it, and didn't they say that 20% of autistic people can learn theory of mind, which completely debunks their own theory anyway, mm -hmm. in my opinion? So many, so many flaws. So um, many. And it was really, really problematic. So it was unreliable across autistic people. Um, like I said, some of us were actually quite good. Some of us not, not so much and so on because variability. But it exactly. does not favorite person in the world this person <laughs> um, followed by tony atwood how other yeah i don't actually have anything to do with him on um, on my slides actually interestingly um and and the issue with the theory, decent, at least he had a crack at it <laughs> yeah i guess um and the, the the issue also with the theory of mind theory is it doesn't account for all autistic features so you remember what i said right at the beginning 
really psychology and psychologists and theorists and so on, they want to come up with the theory. This explains everything about being autistic, not just this little thing here, not just this experience or this experience. It has to explain all of it. That would be a good theory. So this particular theory of mind theory didn't explain anything else. It didn't really explain our sensory stuff. It didn't explain um, restricted repetitive patterns of behavior and, and so on and so forth. So it really was problematic because it didn't account for all autistic so experience. Basically, all this did was put a label on things that neurotypicals find difficult to understand and we may find under difficult to understand about neurotypicals. It just named it. Yeah. Not very well, <laughs> because it doesn't apply to every autistic individual. No, and it's certainly, like it says here, found in other conditions or other experiences as well. Like there's other reasons that people might struggle with a theory of mind of other people's theories, uh, other people's minds, sorry. Um, and so, again, well, it's not just about autistic people then, so it's a poor theory. Uh, there was no still in reports about children. Mm. And that's a problem. They can talk, I mean, they can still talk about perspective taking. Certainly there's a number of us, but not all of us who struggle with perspective taking, but we're gonna get onto that because that'll be the autistic yeah. theories. Um, so the issue as well with this, that there was no empirical support as of 2019, it, it fails empirically, it fails in its specificity, universality so it's not happening for all autistic people it's not specific enough it's not replicable so it doesn't happen if we do it with this autistic person now they might actually be okay with their theory of mind at another point or it just doesn't replicate in studies um, it wasn't valid basically and it had no predictive validity so you can't predict based on that how whether somebody's going to be autistic or whether they're going to experience autism in a certain way and so on so there was lots of very good paper just explaining and debunking it let's talk about executive dysfunction um so this is a group of or the description for executive dysfunction is a group of cognitive processes that regulate control and manage other cognitive processes so said to dysfunction for autistic people um nice little signpost for the um live that we did yesterday which was with melissa simmons on executive functioning differences um, don't necessarily need to describe it as dysfunction it's definitely difference um so there was yes the discussion of well autistic people are autistic because they have an executive dysfunction right and the problem is you get circular reasoning there well why is the person autistic because they have executive dysfunction well why do they have executive dysfunction because they're autistic and you just end up with this like vicious circle that doesn't I mean, really explain executive anything. functioning differences is definitely a thing but again i think it's just a label for a very small thing that some autistic people do experience but not all and not only that again it doesn't explain most of the other experiences that we have as autistic people that connects us right so um just naming an experience yeah, so one of them. On things like that one's called Rob, that one's called Janet. <laughs> That's what we've got. <laughs> and this is the difficulty. So obviously, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up soon, which is the autistic definition of being autistic, not the non-autistic definition of autism. Um, yeah. which is that there's multiple things that connect us as autistic people, not just our difficulties with executive functioning, like you say. So it, it, again, it's it's too narrow and it's not really. And where does ADHD much. fall in that? Because again, it, it's not just specific to autistic people. Even and this, there's, there's a conversation at the minute about ADHD and autism essentially being two sides of the same, uh, different sides and, of the same. And point. now that goes back to, I did take it off the screen, but I guess um, going back to Andrew quite early on mentioning, let me find it. Da, 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 da. We could try and address it kind of now. Oh, we've had some fantastic lots of comments. So I've lost it. Oh, no. Da, 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 da. Basically, Andrew was asking, here we go. So love to hear your thoughts about the comorbidity. So basically the co-occurring, um, basically if you're neurodivergent, i.e. you experience the world in a non-expected way to society's expectations of normal or typicality. Um, but basically, if you're neurodivergent in one way, it's very likely you're neurodivergent in other ways too. Um, so what Andrew's asking here is, yeah, our thoughts on if you're autistic, why is it that we're more likely to also experience dyspraxia, dyslexia, attention differences, um, 
we're also more likely to experience other things as well, which can't be explained at this point in time, like EDS, a so hypermobility and uh, differences in collagen and, and so on. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on this? What, what, what's your thoughts on the fact that we, can, we are likely to be multiply neurodivergent? To be honest, I think when I look at a neurodivergent person, I just see a neurodivergent person. So while we have different names for different things, but I'm coming at this as, as somebody who's not an academic, while we have different names for different things, my brain doesn't go, oh, that's this, that's that, that's this. That's just the labels that I apply to it for other people's understanding. Does that make sense? It's, yeah. it's literally, you know, for me, it's almost like, you know, you may be an autistic person with blue eyes and I'm an autistic person with brown eyes. It, it's just if we have different brains and different neurologies, then we're likely to have that, that. It's all in the same kind of field, isn't it? The way that our brains work. And there's and this is always the issue um, when I teach at um, Access, I'm teaching students who are wanting to go to university, basically. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be mature students um, and we teach psychology. And we do an abnormal, in quotation marks, um, psychology module, which I just call atypical. <laughs> I don't call it abnormal because it's not abnormal at all. Um, and one of the sort of criticisms of the diagnostic manuals is there's too much overlap because brains and behaviour are not clear cut things. Again, it's going back to how psychologists and diagnosticians and researchers, we they want everything to fit into nice, neat little packages, um, but they don't. I think for me, because I'm a very visual thinker, so if I'm looking like, like helping a neurodivergent child or whatever, for me, I see people as kind of recipes, literally in my head that kind of fit together. And they may have that bit of sugar in there, they may have a bit of salt, may have a bit of baking powder but the labels that I apply to that is more to help other people's understanding rather than my own we almost just me and Jodie were saying this quite often we just almost feel it yeah um bizarrely but um yeah so it, yeah like Bobby said it's just neurokin it's not a diagnosis so it's all kind of in the same field um and, and this I is why sorry come on I just don't separate it. The only reason, like we were saying about when we've got executive dysfunction and theory of mind, they're just labels to explain different presentations of the same thing to me. And and and, and then poorly, and it's all deficit based yeah. as well. And again, you know, it's it's still problematic. I promise, lovely people who are here, we are going to get on to the good stuff. We are going to get on to the the more balanced representative autistic theories of autistic experience um but we just yeah, need to define now <laughs> no i'm but not really, really but really yeah. importantly i mean going back into what you were just saying and yeah. this is why you know i don't describe attention deficit hyperactivity disorder i never talk about adhd i talk about attention differences um and like for instance Sai said here Sai's describing some of his profile which is synesthesia misophonia attention differences experiences eds pots you know all these kinds of things knowing the experiences not the diagnoses not the labels but knowing that i'm sitting talking to and communicating with somebody who communicates in an attention differences way and i do that because that's how i imagine it right it's all about the houses Thought trees. Yes, all over the place, you know. Um, you know, do they think in pictures? So are they a hyperfant or are they an affant? That means they're more likely to experience elixithymia, so the difficulty regulating, understanding, expressing emotion, and so on. So all of those things in a non-diagnostic, non-labeling way, all of that information helps, helps me, me know. Help. Yeah. Yeah. How and do that's I communicate? Exactly how I do it. Yeah. Exactly. How do I communicate with this my person head with me? Is a recipe. It's building a recipe of of like what the result is going to be in a person. And that sounds yeah. like, you know, and that's it. And, and, if, and, and with no that, negative yeah, and with no yeah. negative connotations or anything like that. So sometimes I'll, I'll say I'm really working or supporting somebody who has extreme elixithymia. But for me, the way I feel that description, the way I imagine that description that I've just said about that person, there's literally no negative connotation. It's, not negative. it's just it's, it's literally factual. I can't fact. have that person unless I know. And then I've had to think about how those different ingredients in that recipe yeah. interact. 
Yeah. But I don't think they're separate. I think that people have just gotten so obsessed with um, separating out. I mean, we used to have yeah. different di diagnoses. You know, we've thankfully scrapped them and we've just got autism now, which, again, is an abstract concept. But eventually it's all going to come under the umbrella of neurodivergence, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's where we're going. So with so much crossover, I have often thought that neurodiversity is all part of one larger spectrum. And, and this is the thing, because neurodiversity as, as a biological Everyone. fact is the whole of humanity. Every single brain is different from one another. When we talk about neurodivergence, we're talking about social constructs. So some people get stuck with the word neuro. They think it means it's a, a bio discussion, a bio narrative. And it's not, it's always been a social narrative, a social model. So while it's based on biology, that all brains are different, the actual discussion on neurodivergence, neurotypicality and so on, is a social understanding. It's which groups of people who share some commonality, i.e. autistic people, people with attention differences and so on, how are they oppressed? How are they marginalised? How are they treated in society? So it helps us have those discussions. I've gone off onto a neurodiversity tangent and we um, that's a whole other talk. Um, but yes, there's so much crossover. And, and yeah, Tanya, you do exactly what I do is... It just helps you know, right, I know this about that person. They think in pictures. They they don't think in pictures. They have elixithymia. They this, that, and the other. Their communication is in this way. It helps you. Particularly, I had somebody, fantastic conversation I had yesterday with somebody really, I say this because the majority of people I talk to are neurodivergent. I get very bored quite quickly if they're neurotypical. I really apologize, neurotyp neurotypical people. You just don't Border take my interest, right? right? But if it's an if it's a neurodivergent person, I just find everyone who's neurodivergent so fascinating. The way their brains work, how they communicate, what they have to communicate. And this fantastic person yesterday, the consult was supposed to be an hour, and we ended up talking for about two and a half hours. And they are fascinating. They are autistic. They likely have attention differences. They also have the drive for autonomy, um, profile, all these kinds of things. But knowing all that information, working that stuff out, asking them, do they think in pictures or not, that realising they're also elixithymic, all this kind of thing, it really helped me work out how to what support them with their well-being. Yeah. And I think that's important for me as well, because a lot of my work, even though there is the, the law and the advocacy side, it's not just that. It's it's supporting parents to better understand their children it's supporting young people directly children directly that it's not just it's educating really everything we do even you know even though there is a lot of kind of advocacy law meetings in schools social services etc it's always underpinned by educating about autistic experience whether I'm sat in a social care meeting or whether I'm on the phone to a parent or whether I'm actually directly working with a young person and I can't do that if if I don't have that understanding of what makes that person them. Yeah. And I think it's quite interesting that. So I've kind of gone off on a tangent in my head about narratives, basically, like there really are two large competing narratives. You've got the medical narrative of this abstract thing called autism and you've got the neurodiversity narrative about autistic, humanised autistic experience. They are the two dominant narratives. There's lots of other narratives too and lots of them interlink. You know, we can talk about how the social model of disability fits in or influences or is influenced by neurodiversity and so on. But those are the two main narratives. And I think certainly from my perspective, it can be really, really hard to come away from that medical narrative because it's so embedded in not just about autistic experience, about what is mental health, what is what is this, what is that? And I remember, because I did a year of sociology before I did my psychology degree, and I remember them talking about this need, um, which is really difficult, to actually step out of your narrative and look. And that's really hard. I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think I think for some people it is incredibly hard to not view us as having an autism spectrum disorder. I think it's hard to not view it's, us. It's as very, very new as well. Autistic. It's very new. 
isn't it? Like neurodiversity and, you know, an artist, autistic yeah. people. Yeah, you know, autistic people, like, you know, getting a voice, being on the internet. It is very, very new in terms of how long society is going to cha- take to actually change. Does that make sense? I mean, you're the yeah. yeah. So I mean, it is very new. The, we this is the, the thing is, um, I guess, neurodiversity was first sort of written about both in print and on the internet around the same time by two different people. 1990s, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, so and yeah. 95 was when Judy Singer put it in print into her thesis. And then, and I feel terrible because I should remember their name. I feel like their surname's Bloom, but I might be in, incorrect there. Well, that's um, that B-L-U-M-E. Yeah, well, kind of, they were kind of writing about it on the internet. So they both kind of started writing about it at the same time because it was already being sort of discussed and conceptualised within the autistic community, which it did exist then, but obviously not as well connected because the internet wasn't as great as it is now in terms mm-hmm. of the connection. Um, so, yeah, around 95, but a little bit before that, there was already this sort of move towards this. And, and social the social model of disability and so on that's also impacted that understanding was kind of ex- it existed before then as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I didn't come across the term neurodiversity until 2011, 2012, when I picked up a book because I would go into bookshops as a psychology degree, you know, undergrad, um, looking for psychology books. And there was one on the neurodiversity of mental health. So I didn't yeah. even learn about it in relation to neurodevelopmental yeah. difference um yeah. completely gone off on a tangent well, yeah we've got to think as well about the newness of things like mm. I think I was looking at the history of autism the other day because I'm like I'm working on something called the history of parent blaming instead so I'm going through all the research and pulling out all the bits and it was it was only in 1942 was it that it was first written about or was it 19 oh, it, I can't remember. Oh, autism. yeah so mm. and that was supposed that, to be yeah. schizophrenia Childhood schizophrenia. Yeah. And 1942 is not that long ago. <laughs> yeah. So the understanding, that whole thing of, oh, it didn't exist back in my day. And it's like, no, you mean you didn't understand it? It didn't have yeah. a name? And, or it had like, you've name. Just, like we've just said about the DSM-5 already being outdated by the time it's being printed. Like, we, we've got a lag on it, haven't we? <laughs> so I think we will get there. And I think it is moving fast. But, yeah, there's there's always lag, isn't there? Yeah, and it's trying to get it out there and get out the get the narrative out there correctly as well. I mean, that's one of my big frustrations. That's the one, being... Eugene Bleuler. Oh, the original. Yeah. And oh, it's 24. Yeah, see, I'm seeing the letters wrong <laughs> in my brain. Uh, <laughs> and and you know, um, a lot of my frustration because we like to be correct and accurate a lot of the time as autistic yeah. people in terms of the language, you know, I just, ugh, I hate having to correct people that it's not neurodiverse person, it's a neurodivergent or neurotypical person, you know, that kind of thing just bug, bugs me, so, um, but that's a whole other discussion. Okay, right, yeah. so back on to, we're still on cognitive, so this is just about developmental trajectory models, so basically how you develop and the trajectory, where it's going to go, the models. So it's basically a culmination or combination of the things we've already described, which is possible genes versus or times uh, environmental factors, but we don't know what those are other than, like I say, you have children, sperm and an egg met each other. (laughs) Um, And we've already kind of mentioned epigenetics, which is a little bit more of a complex way of describing or a complex model of this gene via environment. So some people think of it as genes times environment, whereas epigenetics is about, um, like say, turning, switching on and off those genes. Yeah, so it's basically a gene that could potentially be something if somebody comes along and something happens that triggers the button thing. Yes, yeah, so... um, I mean, the example I I have, because I've read it and seen it, is not a particularly nice one because it's kind of fat shaming. um, So I apologise. It's not one I believe in as a a model or a discussion. But the way that some that I saw as a way of explaining epigenetics is that you could have a gene um, for being um, slim, for instance, uh, but the environment, i.e. eating lots, will impact that gene and you could end up bigger, right? Um, Mm -hmm. 
unfortunately that's the the example that I've I've seen and I can't think of one off the top of my head right now um I find functioning labels with the most yeah. challenging thing to do I find that the easiest thing to talk about to neurotypicals genuinely I can I mean that's a whole other thing I'd like to do a bite size on that because I've been trying mm -hmm. I say bite size they like 45 minutes long but that's still short for me because I'm really as you all know, we end up here for quite a long time because there's too many things to talk about. Um, but I would like to do a little bite-sized one um, that people can use as well. But I think, Trisha, for you, you could just explain it does not exist as a diagnosis. There is no such thing in the diagnostic manuals as high-functioning or low-functioning autism. Yeah, the way I go about it, I always start with the fact that it is actually inaccurate. Um, I always go for the fact that it's inaccurate, the fact that it means that if we lump people into high functioning and low functioning, that we're not actually looking at what else might be going on for them as well. So it's a perfect excuse. And then I hit them with all the kind of divisiveness and et cetera, et cetera. But if you just go with it, it's, it's just not accurate. <laughs> or actually, Bobby is quite right as well, um, that, Tricia, you can use other terminology which doesn't put the onus on the autistic person. So function labels are a problem because they're saying it's about the individual and their functioning and that's the problem. Whereas we can talk about um, support needs, whether they're high or low, and that can change, that allows for fluctuation. Mm -hmm. And it also means you're focusing on the environment, not the autistic person being the, the problem. Yeah. And if they shut you down and don't listen, don't waste your spoons. Yeah, like, there's that. You've you got to guard them. They're precious. Save it for somebody who wants to listen. Like the reason for not getting into anti-vax debates. It's just no, there's just no point a lot of the time. No. Um, so I'm not going to go through these. There's there's extra theories that relate to cognitive stuff as well. Like I say, lots of people have tried to theorise that we have things like a weak oh. central coherence that we can't, um, what is it that, highly skilled in tasks involving attention to detail but less skilled in global processing looking at the bigger picture that's crap. again you problem. can't make just from a personal perspective i had somebody ask me about this and i said no absolutely i can see bigger pictures i can see bigger pictures massively but i cannot see accurate big pictures without the detail so i don't want to go straight to again the all have their criticisms. Yeah. Uh, then we ended up with Simon Baron Cohen. He does like to make a theory. He came up with the empathizing, systemizing idea that arguably autistic people have extreme male brains because arguably male brains are more likely to be systematizers um, and not empathizers. Um, there's lots of problems with this. It kind of fed into the idea that we lack empathy to be very clear. It was never discussed that we lack emotional empathy. It was that we struggle or lack or have deficit, in quotation marks, in perspective taking, which is cognitive empathy. So he just fed into, sadly, um, the stereotype that we lack emotional empathy, which is not it's, the case. It's starting to get a little bit embarrassing for SBC, isn't it, reading all yeah. this? It, it, that's, yes, very true, because a lot of his theories don't hold water at all. So he came up with this extreme male brain theory. Now, the problem with that is when a lot of us who are not male started realising we were autistic, he then wanted to argue that we had female, extreme female brains. Um, the problem with all of this is he never looked, there's, there's actually no scientific neurological evidence you wouldn't be able to look at a brain and go, that's a male brain and that's a female brain. So to even then try and jump on a flawed understanding. That there's a problem for any. <laughs> that's a polite way of putting it, yes. Um, so I've already mentioned, led to the myth that autistic people lack empathy. Um, there is no empirical, that means nobody's measured, looked at, held and, you know, done a proper study so no empirical evidence for gendered brains there's no such thing you can't see male or female brains well, so that's, very good that's as ridiculous as having gendered eyes isn't it or gendered fingernails or gendered Just anything yeah yeah it's it's all very problematic um and so like i say when when you started to see um non-male autistic people um, there was then some discussion that I haven't seen too often of um, extreme female brains, which, again, is problematic. And Ooh, then there's I this. Read that for a giggle. 
but then there's Bayesian predictive coding model, which I don't know enough about, but it kind of sounds very close to or linked to what we will discuss briefly, which is the monotropic mind. But basically, we're constantly surprised. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so limitations of all of these, they're male bias, because a lot of them were theorized before realizing that or women, non-binary and trans people can be autistic. So it ignored a lot of our experiences. Um, and it also ex ignored some men. So males who were assigned male at birth still identify as male, but don't have that typical uh, presentation that Simon Baron Cohen might class as that male brain. Presentation. Yeah. yeah, they might have more of that mask presentation and so on. Um, you know, it also ignores those people. So it, all of those theories tended to be very, very narrowly focused on a very particular type of autistic person. Um, I've already mentioned circular reasoning. Why are they autistic? Because they have executive function issues. Why do they have executive function issues? Because they are autistic. Like there's no, there's no tangible, what are we talking about here? Yeah. Um, there was also, what was the other one? Was it female autism phenotype as well? That was interesting that um that was somebody oh barry manilow barry manilow mandy did that one. Oh, okay yeah, yeah. sorry i and always see barry manilow when i think about that one um oh and wasn't that that females have a different type of autism and they are what is it purposefully camouflaging basically we're sneaky autistics and victim blamed so this goes back into that whole problem um of female and male yeah of, of gendering autism at all because like i say you 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 see the different types of autistic experience that we've described where some people uh, might be masked presentations and so on you see that regardless of gender it's 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 there's so much variability in our community um and obviously i say obviously but the really important paper for anybody to read if you want to understand masking is the new Kieran Rose and Amy Pearson paper, which Tanya is very aware of, um, is a fantastic paper. It explains what non-autistic researchers who are discussing camouflaging in the literature, the problems with that is blaming us and saying that we are being sneaky. Um, and like I say, it ignores lots of other experiences of different genders and so on within our community. Um, very problematic. Fantastic paper, though, uh, that Kieran and Amy wrote. Um, I might be watching, I'll get a big head. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a good paper, though. <laughs> um, so further issues with these theories, they're based on observable behaviour only. So again, even though they might be discussing cognitive, potential cognitive theories, they're not asking us what it's like. What is our brain actually doing? What is it thinking? And how I mean, who'd have thunk of that? <laughs> Um, it's all by non-autistics who are outsiders looking at us. They're not actually autistic people realising from the inside out. It ignores context and social norms. So, again, it's all based on deficit and so on because it's based on um, are you being weird in this social context, which actually this social context or social norm might be completely different in 50 years' time. Um, ignores cultural differences as well in social norms. So we might not be necessarily classed as autistic in certain societies and cultures where eye contact is actually not expected at all and is considered rude you know so you might be some of those uh, indicators of what is classed as autistic won't be classed as autistic in certain cultures um, yeah. and alone each of those individual theories that we've discussed they don't explain all autistic experiences and differences um, to non-autistics so they like lack biological and construct validity so they're not valid in any biological or even when we consider the theory um, they're not valid um, and neuroscientific and biological research rules out or rule out single gene and focal brain lesion causal models of autism in favor of multifactorial so lots of things can explain why we're autistic um, so it's just we're very complicated because we're human basically humans are complicated what have i got here oh okay so this is just just everything we've discussed so that's just a summary um but more importantly i don't want to go through the summary we've just gone through everything um it's all crap basically it, it, 
it's a problem because they're all individually not going to explain anything. So what we've got here from Fletcher Watson and Happe in their autism, it's literally called Autism, the book published in 2019. I have lots of problems with the book, um, still find it very problematic in terms of its narrative and things like that. But there are some bits that are quite useful. So for instance, they have this figure that is quite um, important, I guess, is to understand how complicated it is to explain that we're autistic. Because biology, in some capacity is clearly going to be relevant to whether we're autistic or not. Um, but that doesn't mean, like I said before, that even if we found biology, that we found disorder, you've just found biology, that's it. Um, so basically what they're showing here is that to be autistic means biology, it means cognition, how our brains work, it means the behaviours that we exhibit. But more importantly, all of these things can shape one another because of the plasticity of the brain, like you described. So our behaviours and society could impact our cognition and our behaviours again and our biology. So it all goes backwards and forwards. But most importantly is what I flagged is really what makes us have autism spectrum disorder is perceptions and judgments of society. That is the only thing that dictates whether we're disordered. Because society chooses whether we're disordered and who decides who decides. Yeah. It's a massive game um, of because they say. So this is me, I guess, explaining what makes or why is there autism spectrum disorder? So like I say, pub perceptions and judgments. But that's not what we're talking about when we talk about autistic experience. That's a different thing. That's a humanised thing. So the thing that makes us autistic is that Again, it's, it's kind of circular, so I'm kind of just as bad as those other theories. We're autistic because we're autistic, <laughs> um, which isn't really a good enough ex um We're autistic uh, because we're a load of people that share some things in common, so therefore we are autistic. <laughs> yes. It is going to be the same way as explaining why am I white. You can find the gene that tells me that I'm white and so on, but you definitely haven't found disorder. Um, but I do share cultural or societal um understandings of my experience of the world as a white person right mm. and so on okay so autistic theories of autistic experience there's really not as many so feel free to come up with some um if you're autistic yourself so why autism is not sorry why autism is not a disorder so this is autistic theories of autistic experience so we're not talking about this abstract thing called autism now we're talking about people and our shared commonality i have this just as um a, a nice little um, uh sort of caveat as well and or demonstration of why we're not disordered um, and kind of going back onto that it's really the thing that creates disorder is society's perceptions and judgments so this is um chris Bonello of autistic not weird fantastic uh, autistic advocate um and he states i'm autistic which means everyone around me has a disorder that makes them say things they don't mean not care about structure how to hyper focus on singular important topics, have unreliable memories, drop weird hints, and stare creepily into my eyeballs. Um, and then somebody's asking, So, why do people say you're the weird one? Because there's more of them than me. And this is just the fact, right? Whether we're talking about statistical, statistically, there's more of us. That's why we're disordered, being classed as disordered, because statistically, we're a minority, or because we are. A disempowered group and actually there's loads of us if you wanted to look at the numbers but society as a whole is making that distinction di dictating that we are the disordered one because there's more of them they have the power to say that we're disordered basically so history is always written by the winners isn't it and there's more oh, yeah. Of, yeah the winners the powerful whether they're statistically the majority or Power, powerfully the majority yeah. if that makes sense um so let's talk about autistic community definitions of autistic experience so uh, one of my favorite memes um i love love a good meme um is me explaining there really is no autism like i said you can't measure it i've hopefully demonstrated that with with the discussion we've had you can't see it you can't measure it you can't smell it you can't find it in the dna and so on so there really is no autism that's an abstract concept but there 100 percent is autistic people where we share some commonality which is what connects us as a population and culture um so basically for us to be autistic can be we can discuss it as a neurodevelopmental difference so we are born and develop in an autistic way um, and our, our brains work differently to non-autistic people 
Um, and then what connects us then? So while there is a variety of autistic people, so like Tanya, you, you were discussing, some of us might have attention differences, so our communication will be slightly different than if we were just ready sorted autistic and so on and so forth. Um, but just because, yes, there's a lot of variety within our community, but there is definitely similarity that connects us. Um, and importantly, it flips the diagnostic manual on its head because it's an insider perspective. So when you look at the diagnostic manual, it lists almost as a throwaway comment, like an add on that they just thought about at the end. Um, that we might process sensory input differently. That's right at the end. Whereas from an insider perspective out, we would say... That underpins everything. Yeah. Our sensory processing differences explains every other behaviour that we exhibit. Yeah. So we have differences in processing uh, sensory information, uh, differences in communication, and then differences in thinking, socialising and moving. We're talking here of differences. There's no deficit there's no but again it, the underpinning of that is because we have different sensory experiences of the world and different yeah. thinking and different processing because of the amount of sensory information that's coming in we're going to have different communication because we have different experience therefore mm -hmm. we're going to have different thinking socializing and moving and that's absolutely what I tend to say in training so I mean what I tend to also explain is that all human beings as organisms, the only way we know how to interact with our world and decide on action or inaction is via taking in sensory information from the world, via the mechanics of the body, processing it in the brain, and then we make a decision, right? Sometimes that's unconscious, like breathing, <laughs> and sometimes it's conscious, like breathing, and then I can't remember how to breathe if you're being <laughs> conscious. You about it? So if any of that process taking in the sensory information via the mechanics and then processing it in the brain is even slightly different two human beings would have qualitatively different experiences of the world and I usually give the example of if your cones in your eye the mechanics of your eye are slightly different to mine you and I would perceive the color green differently so we would have qualitatively different experiences of the same thing the colour green to you it's still green and to me it's still green so when we both say green we know what we mean even though we're seeing different things yes and that's just the mechanics and that's just one tiny element of a sense i.e taking in the yeah. colour green as sensory information whereas as autistic people we would argue or a lot of us do that we process all sensory information light sound smell the inside of feelings of our own bodies and so on and so forth qualitatively different to non-autistic people and that then impacts how we hear people see people smell people and so on so your communication is different so the way you think move socialize is different um so i guess really even though it's not necessarily depicted in that sort of research way i guess is that there is that theory that is an extra theory that well, that's what the community is telling us that's yeah. the one thing we all have in common. You know? Yeah, fundamentally, we process sensory information differently. Yeah, and Thank that under Nelson everything. for loving salad cream. Wait, oh my, <laughs> oh my lord! It's team salad cream tonight, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> team salad. Ah. Cream. Um, I just want to jump on. So we've got Jenny's comment, which is one of the problems that they've noticed is many autistic people also think that they are disordered. They've been told this and believe it to be true. Um, and that's how oppression works. Yeah. And and this is the case. This is why we all I think I noticed as you uh, you uh, Tanya yesterday saying as well about gentle education. That is what yeah. we are about. We are about on our different platforms, in our different resources. We I mean, me particularly, my interest is scooping autistic people so that they are not isolated. They are not alone and that they are not um, or they at least get to learn a different narrative to improve their well-being. Um, yeah. So I completely understand how difficult it is. It's actually quite distressing as well to see autistic people who are so embedded in that narrative that maybe you haven't got that little crack to get in and they haven't got that bit of doubt in that narrative. Sometimes we can't reach those people. But if there's a little crack, you can. Yeah. And I think also what's really beneficial as well is not just scooping people up that aren't necessarily ready to be scooped up. Because I think I did a post the other day about internalised ableism in um, 
So we said late diagnosed children is a massive, massive issue. But you don't necessarily have to shout the word autism or autistic experience. Sometimes you can just lead by example. And, you know, things like Mel, Jodie and me do, especially with young people, is we just let them experience double empathy, which we're going to talk about. We don't have to necessarily say that we are autistic or we are neurodivergent. It's just just being the example as well. You know, that's how you gently educate, isn't it? Yeah. You don't necessarily have to confront them with it. And and it, sometimes, you know, I've had some fantastic people who've come through our student um, at the University of Post-Diagnostic Support Programme. Fantastic, mm. lovely young guy um, who was diagnosed autistic at seven and attention differences at 11 or the other way around. I can't remember which way around it was. Um, but they obviously, they had really, really taken on the stigma. They they saw themselves as disordered with deficits. You know, the way they described themselves, their well-being was quite poor because of that narrative. And it was really quite heartbreaking. But there was clearly a want to not think that way because they came to our program and they wouldn't have come to our program if, if they, they yeah. if they weren't interested in a different narrative and it was the most beautiful thing he was my in that particular group so we usually have about eight eight students he was the one person that was my benchmark it was like we have to reach him and get him to recognize that he's not a person with autism spectrum disorder that he's an mm. autistic person who's part of the community and a shared culture and it was amazing like yeah. from the the beginning he came through the program he was a person with autism spectrum disorder and coming from yeah and just coming from that deficit-based model which is so ingrained even in professionals and schools and everywhere in pediatricians in diagnosticians to then be confronted with his neurodiversity his autistic experience here's all these happy autistics you know it, it can quite often feel like we are disregarding the difficult things but we're not at all and we try to be incredibly balanced we talk mm -hmm. about what we're challenged by not that we're challenging what we're challenged by yeah. um what we struggle with and so on and we we teach one another skills and tools about how to manage burnout and things like Burn, that burnout yeah you're saying no <laughs> so it's balance it's not deficit and it's not shiny, everything's great. It's balance. And that's the most important thing. And like I say, for him, at the end, he was writing, he was telling us um, in the evaluation as well that he'd started writing um, covering letters for like job interviews and things. And he was writing in there, I'm autistic, which means I'm going to bring this strength to the yeah. job. And that was, I was just like goosebumps because I was yeah and do you know what do you know you were saying about one of the best things I mean the community's taught me so much but actually I think one of the most useful and powerful things for me especially um getting rid of the internalized ableism and the self-gaslighting has been strengths-based working and working to your strengths and the things that you're not so good at not pushing those up because I think as a society as well, when we look at education, we don't do that. Not until you get into like A-levels or even then it's very limited, isn't it? So really you're looking at degree level. We don't do any of that, um, which makes no sense. <laughs> but and, yeah, and this, yeah and get it cleaner. Like, get this, why do I mean, most of the time when people describe challenges and or strengths, they will say strengths and challenges. And I purposely try to always say challenges and strengths because then your my whole thing is that we should be focusing on how to support and reduce and ameliorate the challenges so that then all you've got is a lot of time and energy to focus on the strengths and put those into practice or play or whatever it is that those strengths might be because I think yeah just so that we've got that balance for a change it as opposed to death. absolutely no logical sense wasting your spoons on something that you can be mediocre at when you could spend those spoons on something you could be great at it makes no sense and people should I just think that that's one of the biggest lessons I've taken away from the community to be honest don't sweat the small stuff <laughs> just focus on what you're good at and 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 you're at, yeah absolutely everything i've learned about improving my well-being 
like I say, has come from Annette, her teaching me about stimming and, and to stim freely, and which I found really difficult at the beginning because, you know, I don't want to look like a child with toys and things like that. And now I'm like, nope, this helps my well-being. I'm going to be doing it because that is my need, that is my boundary, and I'm going to assert that. But that's hard. And you need other people to give you the strength and the community sort of connection yeah. so that you're not isolated. Yeah. And so I flagged Trisha's comment um, for that reason, which is that Trisha wishes that their son was more positive about his autism. Um, Again, but you can... there's, yeah, there's a lot of autistic culture that you can, I mean, this is like literally what I do on a daily basis with parents. There's a lot of autistic culture that you can bring into your home and learn from the neurodivergent community about living an authentically neurodivergent family life that doesn't necessarily have to say the word autism or neurodivergent. It, it just makes things easier. And anything that really encourages that authenticity and following your gut and not sweating the small stuff, it, you're there with it, you know? That's my and, opinion anyway. <laughs> and I think as well, Trisha, I, I imagine you can tell if, you, if you've been with us from the start of today's session, if you haven't, don't worry, you can feel free to catch up. Um, but if you've been here even half of what we've been discussing, is it any wonder that your fantastic son doesn't feel positive you know these are the narratives before obviously for now this this is the autistic community definition which is not negative but everything up until this slide is incredibly negative you know the culture of autism this abstract idea called autism is wholly deficit wholly negative and doesn't give you any reason to feel good about yourself as a human being the autistic culture yeah more balanced connection belonging Real validation real. Um, it's based on real life experience because if we look to all the research in those negative old stuff that we've just looked at technically me and you as autistic adults shouldn't be here having this conversation talking about it in a reciprocal way with empathy <laughs> and, and yeah and our communication is so clearly i because uh, we've had this discussion haven't we that it's clearly an autistic attention differences you know Bam. back and forth yeah um but it's definitely not a neurotypical no, conversation, definitely. like the, the the mode of conversation. It's, um, fragment, it's fragmented monologuing rather than a yeah. reciprocal conversation. Which to non-autistic people appears rude, that you're just monologuing. It's like, no, that's how we share. We are connected. You get excited. It's silly. Yeah. So if exactly. I see something and it's there because of my attention differences, I can literally sit and go... I need to and nobody's going to yeah yeah uh, comment thank you Sia. I was actually going to ask as well Trisha how old your son is um if they're 13 years or over we do have um it's growing so we do need more fantastic autistic people to join our info dump vaults so that there's more conversation going on because at the moment there's not enough people to keep a conversation in the different um chats so we're 16 fantastic so yeah you know if he's ever interested yeah comes from different things as well sorry there's spectrum gaming andy was supposed to be on tonight if he is a gamer they have lots of different servers etc etc i think you can find them at spectrumgaming.net if he's ready if he is a gamer and he's ready to look for a one-to-one -one mentor there's mel at gecko community she does a lot of that she's very skilled um if he is ready for a more kind of wanting to talk about it mentor then there's jody or myself or even chloe if he wants to learn about autistic experience if he's ready if you need more information about how you can bring in um autistic experience and neurodivergent family life into your family home or understand what's going off for him particularly there's me, there's Jody, there's Chloe. Like literally, they, they, I think we, I, I doubt there's a person that we can't support between us as a community. And, and what you said is really important as well, Tanya, is that some of the resources you've just described, you don't have to focus on it being about autism. No. You know, if he's not interested, it could just be just having a conversation with somebody. So a lot of the time when I... Tanya, Mel at Gecko, Jodie Smitten, um, support or chat with or work with young autistic people, we 
don't tend to go in and go, we're talking about autism. We yeah. go in and we just have a chat. Yeah. We talk about what are they interested in. And you know and what? Bit, when we get yeah. to monotropism, that will explain why we do that perfectly. But I'm going to wait until we get there. <laughs> we'll get to, yeah, we're going to get to that. But, yeah. um, but you know, and, and given his age, he may make a decision later to look into it. But it's very understandable why so many autistic people reject the diagnosis. There may be, yeah, there may be demand avoidance, there may be burnout, there may be trauma, there may be masking, there may be, you know, the what's available information wise, stereotyping about autism. You may be thinking that autistic people all have high support needs when that's not the case. It, there's so many different reasons that that happened. That's actually the last part of this, which is some autistic people uh, need support with day to day living. But very importantly, particularly in our community, there is no judgment on that because no human being is an island. We all will be dependent on another human being. Um, some of us more so than others that can fluctuate. Um, and so that's just fact of life. Um, but ultimately, there's no one way to be autistic. So this is us trying to show the commonality that connects us but trying to move away from the stereotypes that we're this narrow particular way of experiencing the world. Yeah. yeah. Okay, right, on to autistic theories. Okay, we probably won't go for too much longer because I can feel us both lagging and I know no, I need more. Yeah, but we just got to the good bit, Claire. Oh, no, we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna disappear from the good bit because the good bit needs to no. be done. Okay. Um, so very, very important two theories about autistic experience from autistic people researching and theorizing what it means to be autistic. Um, I can't do this justice. So I'm going to hand this over to um, Tanya in a second. But I do want to sort of, it's really interesting that we ended up doing this today. Because Dinah Murray, fantastic and very important autistic person from our community. It was her memorial service today. And she gave us uh, the, what, a very important theory, which is the monotropic mind theory. And her um, her offspring, Fergus, I don't want to misgender them, so I don't want to give them a gender without knowing what they go by. Um, but her offspring, Fergus, um, also discusses um, and talks about and researches to some in some capacity this idea of the monotropic mind theory. So do you want to try and explain it? Because I always struggle. I will do, but I'm probably not going to do it in academic ease like you do. You don't need Basically. to. Yes, that so might help me. Monotropism kind of underpins. It's the biggest explanation. Um, so do you know how you were saying that all the other theories that we've looked at don't actually explain a large chunk of autistic experience? For me, monotropism does. It basically says that autistic people are only able to maintain um, a certain amount of attention tunnels at one time. So whereas neurotypical people are polytropic, think uh, polytropic, is it polytropic? Yeah, polytropic thinkers, they're able to think surface level about a lot of different, so it's like multitasking, brain multitasking, surface level about a lot of different things and flip between them at any one time. But monotropic thinkers, and again, if we look, if we put this back to sensory experience, um, and how much detail we take in through our senses, this makes perfect sense because the monotropic mind wants to focus in but doesn't filter things out. It needs all of the details to make an accurate bigger picture. So for me, if we want to go a bit further with this, if we look at things in terms of, you know, children not being able to handle mainstream school or burnout, for example, if you are a monotropic thinker and you are in a, I mean, the easiest example for me is a mainstream school because that's what I deal with every day. You are in a mainstream school with 30 children in and you've not been able to eat your lunch. So you're hungry. You are, you know, there's 30 children fidgeting around. You don't know what their behavior is going to be like. They're not predictable. You're trying to focus on what the teacher's doing. The lights are flickering. You are desperately trying to suppress stims. What's happening there is your attention is being split in so many different directions and our brains are just not designed to do that. So for me, it makes perfect logical sense that what happens then when we, we've been pushed to that limit is that we hit burnout. 
So for me, monotropism, it just underpins everything about autistic experience and why we have that experience, whether it's sensory, whether it's, you know, and even to not knowing when we're thirsty or when we're hungry, etc. Because if we're focused in on something, it will be at the detriment to other things because we don't have the attention tunnel spare to manage other things, maybe emotional regulation, maybe sensory regulation, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I love monotropism, to be honest. <laughs> I hope I, I, hope I did helps. it justice. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. And it also helped people understand why we are more likely to have dedicated interests, which would be class of special interests in quotation marks. Yes, because for you me, know, I think monotropism is also a stim. It's also a form of meditation. If we're overwhelmed or consciously processing a lot of things that we've, you know, say we've been out to the supermarket that day. Now, you and I both know that that's going to completely deplete our spoons. But why does that happen? Is it because of monotropism? Is it because that's an unconscious attention, attention tunnel that's being used up by processing the entire experience that we've been through from a sensory perspective? Is, is that what it is? You know, and then when we go past that, we hit burnout. But yeah, I mean, it's just it just underpins everything for me. I can't find fault in it yet. Have you found anything? No, not really. And 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 it allows, yeah, like you say, it's it's much more useful to understand multiple things that we would class as autistic experience. Mm -hmm. um, so, Jenny, I can't speak if I can hear someone else talking. It exactly, confuses me. Exactly, because that is because if you're a monotropic thinker, you are unconsciously managing your sensory environment and also processing things that are on the mall shelf, as I like to call it. I'm sure that's not a scientific term, but it works on the, for me. On the what shelf? The mall shelf. So do you know when you put things in the processor and you just have to mull on it, you know, leave oh, it in the no. background? Okay, right. The mall shelf. <laughs> I call it the mall shelf. You know when somebody gives you an idea and you say, I need to process that, it goes on the mall shelf. Right. But, but yeah. that's what it is. So for me, I think there are unconscious attention tunnels happening as well and I think that there are a lot of those happening depending on how control in control we are of our environment and the sensory stimuli that's coming in um emotion is another one I think you kind of helped me understand this even a bit better in the sense of like I say you've got that singular attention tunnel which means it's absorbing everything yeah because you're trying to focus on one thing, but it's absorbing everything. So that can help me kind of understand a little bit yeah. better. About so then if we, yeah, but then if we look them. at hyperfocus, now that is something that we do for joy, but it is also something that we seek out when we are completely overloaded. So to me, again, not a scientist, that is a kind of meditation for me. That is something that allows me to focus so deeply on something that it gives the rest of the unconscious process in a break. A bit like with your attention differences, if I'm on the phone to somebody, I can clean my entire house. If you sat there and said, clean your house, I'd be like, what do I do? Because <laughs> you, you know? that, yeah, split it, um, yeah. split the attention. Um, I've just seen, yeah, because Bobby is like, double empathy. Um, we're actually going to, so although we will touch on double empathy here, we won't spend too much time on it because we have a whole panel discussion where I am um, hopefully, uh, if you remember, we are lucky enough that we are going to have Damien Milton, who actually developed or conceptualized yeah. the theory double empathy. Um, so we'll discuss that. And Bobby is very, very knowledgeable. So we've got Bobby, Damien Milton, Kieran Rose, mm -hmm. and Annette Foster, and myself, we're going to do like a panel discussion purely on double empathy. But we will discuss it here because it makes sense, because what we've done is talked about these different theories. Yeah. So double empathy. I like thinking of it as it's not me or you, it's both. So the issue, obviously, the stereotypes that autistic people lack empathy, that we lack perspective taking with anyone, actually, which is um, problematic, that we have a deficit in empathy. Um, and what Damien described and discussed was actually it's not that at all because when you bring autistic people together relatively speaking because it's always going to vary we are actually quite good at perspective taking with one another at recognizing one another's behaviors communication style you know all that kind of thing so actually we are quite good at perspective taking at empathy 
with other autistic people. So what Damien was describing is that it's a cross neurotype. So you've got non-autistic and neurotypical and autistic people. And there's a translation error. There is an issue because you are both coming from different frames of reference. So you can't easily empathize with one another. Yeah. Um, how would you do any well, you would can add? see that in society anyway I mean we, if if you know we could empathize easier with people that weren't like us we wouldn't have racism we wouldn't have sexism we wouldn't have anti-semitism would we <laughs> well we probably would but that would be a lot less and I but think it's the difficulty in empathizing with people and mm -hmm. the fear of the difference as well I think that's where it comes from and I imagine absolutely you can use the double empathy problem to describe lots of mm -hmm. cross group exchanges or yeah. breakdown breakdowns in cross group exchanges. Yeah, definitely. But absolutely for autistic people, because our experience is so unique to autistic people and the detail that we take in. And, and I think that's with the language processing as, no, as well. I don't know if this has been looked into, but because of the detail that we take in, especially me, I really struggle with language processing because I think in pictures and sounds and feelings and all of the cinematic experience going off in my head, but not words, <laughs> you know. Um, and so language processing is difficult as well. But, yeah, double empathy, I mean, it's based largely uh, fundamentally on sensory experience that's that's sensory experience and monotropic thinking and monotropic thinking and sensory experience is so closely linked it's almost the same thing really. and, and so then if we go back to my analogy that I used to explain for instance if the mechanics of our eyes were different we would experience mm -hmm. the color green different and then when you understand that we actually probably experience everything differently so then it is literally like you've got two different types of people. We're still all human, to be clear. We're not talking about different <laughs> species. But it is like I, I usually use the analogy of the lion analogy, Fitz Wittgenstein, which is that um, if a lion could speak and we could understand them, we still wouldn't understand what they were talking about because their frames of reference and experience are so alien. And their now, culture, the culture yeah. as well. And it comes down to culture. And our shared experience, similar experience creates culture. We are culturally different. I could go to Japan, but I wouldn't have a bloody clue what I was doing. And even if I read the books, I still would make massive faux pas everywhere. Yeah. So and and that's how I've tried to start to get a lot of tra when I'm delivering training, if it's like with, um, say, businesses or schools and things like that. Um, and universities actually have been doing a few more university trainings on trying to understand how to be neurodivergent friendly in the classroom is to instead of start instead of thinking of us as people with a mental dis uh, sorry, uh, uh, disorder is actually thinking of us as a cultural minority where we have our own communication language um you know customs yeah, yeah customs oppression prejudices that are being you know sent in our direction so start to think of us as a cultural minority the way you would other uh marginalized members of that establishment if it's i say business or blah 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 instead of thinking of us as disordered and i think people would get on better in understanding us and recognizing how to support us by thinking of us as a cultural minority uh, well, which i'm not the first person to discuss that but we know. are we, we there is an absolutely no doubt that we have our own culture hmm. like we that's not deniable i don't even know what the definition for that is but i mean how many other people I have, have written on it oh i have wow. Yeah, it's a chapter. It's actually for an edited book by Damien um, and Susie Riddell. Um, okay. It's not out till next year, though. But it's specifically on that. I, I even outline the definition of culture. We absolutely yeah. meet the definition of culture. And we culture is shared. Kids. We raise our kids the same. We have the same approach to parenting and child rearing. We have the same approach to education that we have the, to the energy accounting there is the language between us the fact that it's completely culturally acceptable to say no to somebody and not explain yeah there's so many but yeah um and because of those cultural similarities we empathize with people from our culture yeah exactly
and and Paul. it's yeah i think absolutely this is what we need to get across this is why these theories are so important because this is humanizing this but double empathy it's so simple the overriding yeah. theme i mean we've just spent the best part of two hours going through all that up to waste of money bs that essentially didn't do anything apart from put a label to a challenge really and then we've just sat here in maybe 15 minutes and pretty much explained autistic experience in the most comprehensive way that it's ever been explained by saying that we empathize with people better who have similar experiences to ourselves and we don't look at things from surface level we are only able to deep dive so many things at once but we also have to manage other stuff that's it yep so simple and and what's really starting to be great as well is that so damien is a predominantly sociologist sort of background um and so he came up with the double empathy problem but we're starting to see empirical evidence now as well which is always great so um so i've got a, a a paper up here there are more now they're starting to be more but this is one of the first papers that showed the double empathy problem at work so crompton and fletcher watson sadly um crompton isn't autistic because i i checked to see if they could come on academy but i i still won't have non-autistic people on at this point in time um but basically don't what they don't sell out <laughs> no uh, i know we're too interesting um but basically what they found in their paper was that when they had an autistic person and a non-autistic person sharing information, not knowing that the other person, whatever their neurology status was, um, the communication and the task broke down in those cross neurotype interactions. But when you had the autistic and autistic, non-autistic and non-autistic, the communication and the task didn't break down. So it's mm. starting to see that, you know, fantastic empirical evidence that the double empathy problem is real, which yeah. is great. Yeah, and it, well, yeah, it is. I mean, it, you, it's funny though because we've. I mean, there's some really exciting stuff coming up. I think we spoke about the looking into ADHD at the minute, retention differences, and um, we said we touched on that earlier. Obviously, there's a lot of research going into the PDA presentation as well, which you know, and there's a big push for getting more autistics into academia as well, isn't there? In research, like that, that. If you trying to be that. more collaborative more yeah yeah but also trying to get people in there in the first place i think as well so there's a big push for lived experience as well what's the other thing that's happening oh um alexithymia is now being looked at as a trauma response so that's interesting there's an awful lot that's basically going to feed in because you know my brain works in recipes on top and entwined and in between double empathy and monotropism perfectly which is always good. yeah and and i mean ultimately because sort of my background is stigma ultimately yeah. my my goal is to help people not feel bad about themselves um and i always say is it a chicken and egg scenario do you tackle the self-stigmatizer the person who's t internalized it because they're the people i care about really yeah, yeah. I don't really care about the public and the non-autistic people per se. Um, but it is important to also get the knowledge out there so that people understand us and our communication so that that narrative doesn't yeah. exist for us to internalise in the first place. I don't know where I've gone with this tangent, but... I think for me it's slightly different because um, although I do work with autistic adults and I do have a lot of adult autistic friends and community and I'm in the groups and I'm always about and always available for me I kind of go for the children because I'm massively triggered by children but I experienced school trauma myself and school refusal and very yeah all that awful tackle thing. that negative narrative early. Yeah, yeah. yeah but for me I think what's massively missing is how do we so while you're tackling the negative narrative that is there, and I think I'm still doing that with just existing, really, I think we do that anyway, don't we? We, we never stop talking about ex autistic experience. doesn't matter where yep. we're sat, ever. Yep. <laughs> autistic MasterChef with Tanya. See, I, I can't cook for, I, I can phone a good take. I think on. Ian's talking about your recipes of people. Oh, though. my recipes. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that literally, people just layer up in my brain. But um. I've, oh, I've lost my tangent now. See, attention differences. Where, where were we? 
Oh, so yeah. So ultimately, I think that the research and stuff is massively important because we need to change that kind of lag. We need to keep combating the lag because if people have the information about double empathy, about monotropism, about sensory differences, all those trauma children that are currently going through mainstream schools or not in education that are going to turn into trauma autistic adults that are going to have that really self-stigmatizing view, hopefully will be massively reduced. Yeah. So, so the goal's there essentially, isn't it? Basically, as much as it, we really, really absolutely appreciate so, so much, fantastic people though donate like a pound or two to us so that we can pay our guest speakers ultimately the biggest thing I think our fantastic learners can do is share share our stuff even if you think people aren't interested you know on your own personal pages and things on Facebook or whatever it is please share the information because that's how we get this out here and we are doing it for free as much as I say it's fantastic yeah. if people do donate um ultimately i will do this for free if i win the lottery tomorrow i will still be here because doing it for free yeah this information Absolutely. from us me and tanya i know how much tanya does as well it really is about trying to improve people's autistic lives which i know sounds really cheesy i apologize but it is it, it, that's authentically not, what we're trying to it, do it's not cheesy. I mean, like, sometimes, yeah, sometimes like the, the children in the cases that I work on, I literally pinch myself and go, this can't be real. This can't be happening, you know, but it is, um, you know, and, and I don't want to be miserable, but the figures for suicidality, depression, self-harm, um, I mean, eight year olds on antipsychotic medication because of burnout and poor understanding and poor education that that is not and, something that I made up that was last week yeah <laughs> and and sharing and sharing this stuff that we're talking about like say even mm. you know if I share it hundreds of times thousands of times and we only reach one person so yeah. I'm thinking about you know you fantastic people <laughs> cheese and potato thank you Ian um because I get called potato um yeah. So, you know, if you fantastic people, please do help us share. Mm -hmm. It's not about us growing as a platform at all. It's about can you reach another autistic person or a family and actually make even a tiny little dent so that we can start to make some change for those people's lives? How many, like, autistic people are out there that don't actually understand that there is a different way that's not a deficit based model like that's really sad yeah you know and it is and parents the, the, as well the, when when we look at behavioralism and the, the amount of people that are surprised that there's another narrative you know mm -hmm. it's that's that's one of the saddest things realizing people don't know there's another narrative um i'm conscious because i think my partner's going to start yelling at me that dinner's soon to be ready so um like i say there's definitely on i think bobby's already mentioned it that it's the 28th of august 7 p.m we're going to be doing a big discussion specifically on the double empathy problem because it's so important it's such an important theory um so we're going to have a, a great chat yeah. about that um so let me just think what we've got left okay i've definitely done these bits at other points so this is kind of on here just to sort of get away from and debunk the whole medical narrative the deficit narrative and the issue with how people depict the spectrum so people would have seen this before um and if you're interested and you haven't heard me discussing why that is not a spectrum this is a uh, actually a continuum spectrums, spectrums around do you know what i always imagined even way even now because you know i always talk about recipes um always giant you know um when you go into like a music mixing kind of thing you've got a giant mixing board in a recording studio and they all the little dials go up and down and they can move at any particular point i think oh. yeah so i was just saying there's a meme for that as well that somebody oh, is there yeah. yeah, but literally, like from your day, head, yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, always has been. And when you're thinking about people's recipes, it's like, hmm, I can look at somebody and go, okay, they're this proprioceptive seeking today. Up oh, that goes, and 
how yeah. that impacts everything else. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, basically, if anyone's heard me speaking about this before, uh, I have got a bite size. It's about 45 minutes, though, um, which is on uh, it is on autism versus autistic experience. So it's much more detailed about the DSM and the issue with the autism idea versus autistic experience. And I explained that instead of looking at this um, as a continuum line where all autistic people live and they're sort of stuck and don't move or change, is imagine it's a sausage and that it's one person's life and that you're taking a little snapshot of time um, by looking at their circular spiky profile and that that can change. So that's, I go into a bit more detail in that particular video. So I'm not gonna go over that too much now. I wouldn't even know where to put myself on there, to be fair. It depends exactly, on what task you're asking me to do. <laughs> exactly, that's why it's the idea of it being a sausage instead of a line is that you one individual is born at one end, they die at the other, they live in the middle, and then at any point you can look at their a snapshot yeah, yeah, yeah. and get an I mean, idea. If you're asking me to do shopping, I'm right at the the red end. <laughs> but if you're asking me to talk about, you know, maybe I'm a bit green there, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and I like yeah, exactly. So the 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 way of depicting the spectrum doesn't really represent our um our very varied experiences. Um, so I'm not going to go into lots in this because this is actually a whole other talk that I will do at some point with Annette. Foster. Um, we actually still need to publish this. We've been theorizing. So we do have our own theory. So we've been theorizing since 2018. We have presented it and things like that, but we do need to write about it um, and get it published as well as discussing it. So we'll come on and do it as a whole um, session on its own. But it's basically taking us off that flat spectrum and putting us in three dimensional space. So this is what we tried to do um, in 2018, um, just because we were getting fed up with binaries, this discussion of male versus female autism, ridiculous binary, this idea of severe versus mild autism, ridiculous binary, high versus low, Asperger's versus autism. There's just these frustrating binaries that kept being thrown at autistic people. Um, and it doesn't represent how the spectrum is actually in relation to you as an individual and all of our autistic community. But yes. we're the ones that are black and white thinkers. I know, I know, the irony. The irony! The, you know, the, wow, okay. <laughs> but none of those <laughs> sorts of theories, you know, the idea of the spectrum doesn't represent, and like those binary discussions don't represent autistic development and growth, how we might change from day to day with our spiky profiles and so on. Um, so as diagnosis stands, um, this was just me discussing how what you described actually which is that the latest diagnostic manuals collapsed the so-called subtypes because they don't help so the subtypes where we used to have aspergers and so on you used to have autism spectrum were diff you know they were different they were separated um but basically the diagnostic manual the task force that puts those manuals together realized that people change too much and that somebody who was classed as aspergers at one point in their life might be classed as autistic at another point because we change and so that's how the diagnostic manual described now, support, it support needs change depending on environment yeah. and factors and that was luke wasn't it that autism plus environment equals outcome the only thing you can ever change is the environment Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that change was embraced by the majority of people in the autistic community. Yes, there was a few, uh, a minority that found it frustrating and problematic um, and still do. But actually being autistic is enough. If you then add descriptors of how else I experience the world, you will know how to support me, know how to work out my communication and so on. Um, whereas actually, if I would have been diagnosed under the older manual with Asperger's, that still doesn't really tell you. It doesn't tell you anything. anything. So what was the diagnostic criteria? Was um, being able to speak um, at the same time as neurotypical peers, wasn't it? And it was largely when did you, when, if yeah. at all, did you develop speech? Um, yeah. Largely um, was one of the biggest things that would separate whether you were. You can't even keep speech most of the time. <laughs> right yeah so it's problematic so this is me and Annette were discussing hypothetically um we wanted to afford or this collapsing of the subtypes should have afforded understanding the autistic presentation so this idea of the autism spectrum was supposed to hypothetically um help people understand that we 
have different presentations dependent on lifetime, like across the lifetime in a given year, month, week or day. But it didn't end up, people didn't end up seeing it that way. The spectrum was seen still as that binary continuum, mild versus severe, high versus low. Isn't this what they're trying to do with ADHD at the minute, though? They're trying to get rid of, because it was widely believed that there was hyperactive type and... Oh, and um, inattentive. Yeah, but they're, they're getting rid of it altogether, aren't they? Because they're saying, actually, it's environmental and it will fluctuate. Depending it wouldn't on make sense. Yeah, and it, it doesn't yeah. make sense because, say, um, a young person or a child might be classed as having the hyperactive type. And then as an adult, they arguably lose that hyperactivity but they still experience attention differences so yeah. like you say it's very similar in terms of it fluctuating mm -hmm. um and, and then you the sensory difference as well because wasn't it like they did i can't remember where i read it it's definitely some research that they did some research that 40 percent of children diagnosed as adhd um had sensory processing um profile that basically could have they that would have explained the movement Oh, right, got you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, got you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is the thing, like you say, it's it's just it's we're too much outside of the arising. No, I just think we just keep it to autistic. That's fine. I don't even think we need yeah. the spectrum. No, we definitely don't need the disorder. So no. just autistic is fine, thanks. And and this is the thing as well, which is what a lot of people, professionals, diagnosticians, and so on, will really struggle with is that. I am adamant that we do need to be taking autistic experience out of diagnostic manuals. But people really struggle with that, I guess, because like I say, if we go back to what I said before, which is don't explain that we have autism, autism spectrum disorder, this medical concept, this medical construct, explain we are culturally autistic. We are a cultural minority. Um, and those very different narratives will you know come into that I was just narrative. thinking actually <clears throat> um if we did put what we know about autistic experience in the diagnostic manuals it would literally be it wouldn't be fixed and repetitive interests it would be um ability to hyper focus um ability like well, what else would we be there? Oh, well, empathizing because... with other autistic people. So basically, you could diagnose autistic people by throwing them into a bunch of autistic people and then into a bunch of neurotypicals and seeing which one fared best. And this That's is what I argue in... in the DSM-5. That's basically what I argue in the chapter that, like I say, is going to be out next year. Um, so it's the Handbook of Critical Autism Studies, if they don't cut my chapter. Hopefully they don't. Um, and chapter. I basically <laughs> explain that, which is that, ideally all autistic people of any age we like you say you should be the, the, I just describe it in the same way that people will come to recognize or understand their gender or their sexuality you try on different identities and and experience like go into communities and think is this my community do I feel connected do I communicate in a similar way and yeah. But not just that, with what we've just gone through, with what is available theory-wise and how we've just essentially debunked every tiny little bit of crap that the DSM-5 current diagnostic criteria is based on, and that's gone, like scientifically, because we've now got empirical evidence about theory of, um, about the double empathy theory, it is technically more accurate to do that than it is to base it on the DSM-5. That is scientifically more accurate. And the, Yeah, and there's plenty, it's not just me that's done it, plenty of other people have done it as well, is that, yeah, you can look at the DSM and I tend to do it because I can't help it when I'm yeah. del delivering training. I'll go, I say, I'm, right, I'm reading this verbatim, I don't like the terminology, yeah. and I'll go, you know, criterion, criteria, criteria A, um, differences, difficulties, blah, 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 in social reciprocal social communication and I have to I can't help it I'll just go but with non-autistic people yeah. right um restrict your repetitive patterns of behavior well what they're talking about here is the need for predictability they're talking about our need to regulate via stimming in a greater quantity and quality than non-autistic people because non-autistic people stim too you know so but there are no guides for that it's based on somebody's bloody opinion which is probably massively outdated and 
absolutely shrouded in stigma and stereotype. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and eye contact. Don't forget the unofficial criterion of eye contact. Well, it's even in there. It states um, no reduced or atypical eye contact. Um, and I like to give that information to people as well, because the amount of people who go to a GP who's never read the chapter on autism in the DSM will say, but they make some eye contact or it's fleeting. And it's like, well, yeah, because it says in the DSM, no reduced or atypical eye contact. So as much as I, I dislike and would like to burn the DSM, <laughs> um, it's, it's still, not all black and white, Chloe. <laughs> it allowed it up with the update, with the collapsing of the subtypes, it yeah. actually allowed for more nuanced diagnosis, but we just don't see that in practice, um, yeah. which is obviously a problem. Um, so yeah, so this is when they collapsed it and discussed the spectrum to try and have this more nuanced perspective of what it means to be autistic in the in the manual, they do actually talk about, you know, current level of support needed for restricted repetitive patterns of behavior and then current support needed for uh communication but right. do you know what the the nice guidelines for diagnosing children it's not the same with adults we get a lot more freedom should be a multidisciplinary assessment anyway so that or should be an autistic person <laughs> or or, yeah. or or our Jessica, whose synesthesia is, is really good at picking out neurodivergent people without even knowing them. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I'm ADHD, aren't I, for her? Yeah, in terms of colours and shape for her, I think, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this was all meant to be, like, the, the collapsing was all meant to um, help be more nuanced about autistic experience instead of subtyping and sticking us into these weird binaries um so reverting to subtyping misses the important move to accept autistic person and community variability so annette and i because we were frustrated um wanting to degender autism conceptualization so we don't end up with male female etc cetera, etc cetera, more accurately represent diversity of our experiences um, from the inside looking out for a change and represent the reality of our development and growth across time so for instance um, a third of subtypes were not representative in later adulthood so i already mentioned that to you that somebody might be diagnosed autistic at one point and then they would have received aspergers at another because we change and we develop mm -hmm. and it's not being represented that way so um i was getting very frustrated with the binaries you know that were existing yeah. so annette and i was saying that the problem was historically non-autistic outsiders have looked into the autistic space right they've looked at autistic people and all they can see is the really observable stars and planets so if you are a visual thinker like tanya and myself this is literally what i was thinking in my brain that mm -hmm. if you imagine a ma massive galaxy black void as well to some extent black space all you all non-autistic people can see are the really bright autistic stars which means they're more observably autistic right so they might be the stereotype that, that would be more easily recognized externalizers than people who exactly. are externalized. yeah exactly so that's so that means they're missing all of us who are masked and some of us aren't masked it's just they don't know what autistic actually looks like in a non and this is what does me about the understanding instead of the strategies instead of the tick list like literally if we understand double empathy if we understand sensory differences if we understand monotropism you don't need strategies because you just you work with that yeah 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 um so yeah we were getting frustrated so outsiders looking in phenomenon explains the dearth in research and understanding of the core importance of for instance sensory differences because they're not asking us um and the presentation of other genders or you know the variability across genders and so on so we were getting really frustrated so we came up with the three dimension space um, I, like I say, I'm not going to go into it loads here because I do want to do this with Annette. But if it helps, we're basically trying to get away from this continuum representation here and represent us as planets. But we're more observable at different points in our life and also more observable at different points in a day. So if you take um, a hypothetical person who's born this end. So this is time. I don't know why it's cut off. So this should be time this line here 
this is observable and this is um, less observable, basically, or, ex you know, internal presentation. So all autistic people will have some unobservable autistic experiences like echolasia, where we repeat words and say things in our own heads. Right. So we all have a level or an element of observable autistic behavior and unobservable autistic experiences. Right. So you you plot that. And then what you have on this dimension is time. That's what allows for the fluctuation of, of whether you have great support needs, as in you're getting good support. Maybe your physical health is not doing particularly well. That will impact how observably autistic you are. Um, maybe Burnout. you're really not. Sorry, say again. Burnout. Burnout, right? Yeah. So all of these things change across time. So time represents that fluctuation of all sorts of things, context and all sorts. Um, so what you have here is a, a hypothetical person. So when they were five, they were really observably autistic, potentially, right? But maybe they weren't picked up because they were female. Not that this is anyone's um, hypothetical representation <laughs> being depicted on the screen. But maybe you were really observably autistic at five, right? And so you're a big planet. You can be seen quite easily by those people looking in with their telescopes. Then at 15, you're masked. You've learned to mask and you're really not that observably autistic at all. It makes you much harder to spot. So while this is one individual, you, you've also got to remember there's lots of other human beings in this space as well, but we've kind of zoomed in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I know this is a lot at this time of night, and that's why I say we will be doing this as a proper session on its own at some point. But 15, you're masked. Maybe in your 30s, you start to realise that you're autistic and you become more observably autistic all of a sudden. It's not all of a sudden. It's because you're allowing yourself to be authentically you. And then maybe when you get into your 50s, again, you drop that mask even more or you're just more authentically yourself, etc., which makes you more observably autistic again. So this is us trying to I mean, even then you could zoom right in on the planet itself and then we could go back to that spiky profile that you yeah. we all saw before and see, well, why are they really observably autistic right now? Now, Annette and I have actually discussed how we think there should be no judgment on whether you're observably or unobservably autistic at a point in time. But we would potentially argue being more observably autistic might actually be better for you in the sense of, you're allowing yourself to regulate in your yeah. way. Yeah, I mean, just from professional experience working with children, I worry less about externalizers than I do internalizers. Because they, yeah, they're more likely Every to have shut time, down, yeah. and down, and, and, and you know, yeah. And I'm always well. approached by um, parents whose children are in massive burnout, and it's really worrying, and they're not feeling what's going on on the inside. But when that starts to come back and when that starts to recover, you get a bit more externalizing. And that's always a good thing in my book. Yeah. It's not necessarily. Think, yeah. yeah. And, and because our observable behaviors can be distressed behaviors. Yeah. But they also could just be us allowing ourselves to authentically regulate. It could be that we decide to shave our heads. When we get it, yeah. Yeah. But if it's are distressed <laughs> behaviors, it means that we're feeling that we're feeling. And, it. Yeah. Yeah. And so all importantly, while this is a um, representation or a hypothetical lifetime of somebody, you could change the time at the bottom to say a day. And so instead yeah. of that's age five, 15, 35 and 55, that's actually um, say that's in the morning before they go to school and they're having a bit of a meltdown because school is really difficult. And then when they're in school, they're masked. And that's why you are not seeing them being autistic in quotation marks at school and then when they leave school they get to be authentically themselves in a safe space because you are safe to them and have a big meltdown which is much more observably autistic so this um i had a family that actually really liked this they wanted to show school to say this is why you're not seeing them as autistic at school because of that mask presentation they are not as observably autistic until they get home because it's not safe yeah exactly um oh yeah i did have it there there we go yeah so you could yeah potentially zoom in and actually have a look at what their spiky profile was doing at that point in time as well um so that was yeah what annette and i we really need to publish on um but just to get away from the um the continuum and the binaries that are being used so i've just flashed up the references um i'm not going to leave them up for long because you can come back and 
stop the video. <laughs> um, thank you, lovely people who are still here. That was, I know, very content heavy. Um, we did well, though. We have got it all in. Yeah, we've done it. I'm tired <laughs> and I'm ready for noms. Fantastic. I know. I'm just thinking, oh, I'm going to go get on the crisps. <laughs> um, so I'm really sorry that we didn't look at the comments. Um, Cy was helping with some. and I know we, we grabbed a couple that were really relevant um, and helpful at different points in time. Um, but there was a lot of content to go, get through. Thank you so much, Tanya, for jumping on last minute um, to do this, this topic. We are very much hoping. I did see Andy comment early on. Um, but we would love to see Andy at some point. We're just um, aware that Andy's struggling Obser with commitments. What's this? Observable in reaction to a traumatic, so only seen one in distress. Ah, yeah. but the problem yeah. is with masking, a lot of autistic people suppress that distress. So, and yeah. again, this is not this necessarily is... distress. Like I've been sat here tonight, stimming away, and I'm not distressed. Yeah. But and, and Ian's quite right as well, though. This is this is where I've I mean, that's a whole other talk that we've already done. We've done mm -hmm. some talks with yourself about young people and burnout. We've done ones with Jodie Smitten and Mel Duncan yeah. on burnout and how that is to some extent an observable distress response, the burnout where they're shut down in their rooms and all this kind of thing. Um, but we can all as autistic people have different ways of being observably autistic and struggling with trauma and so on because I described how I wasn't in a safe place to be able to burn out at home so I went to a whole binge drinking and getting in fights in clubs right so you've got I went through that phase different yeah <laughs> eventually trauma will rip off the mask no yeah. I don't think it doesn't that's the problem and that's why we have the high the high suicide rates because we we get into we shut down and that that is way more dangerous, um, especially in children, than um, being the externalizer. And if you are an externalizer as a child, um, a lot of the time it's down to educational placement. You are then an inconvenience for the educational placement that you are you are at. So that means that you will get another one. Whereas if you are the internalizer and the child, I mean, we've had. Um, you know, we've had children that are literally self-harming, but still will not be medically signed off school. But if they were in school throwing chairs and throwing tables, you can bet your bottom dollar that they would find them another school place in a suitable environment. So, yeah, it's um, it internalising is definitely more dangerous as far as I'm concerned, just based on my experience. Uh, it's we just yeah we need not to that. Do... he's not arguing about which one's worse it's just yeah. unfortunately what? society those that cause inconvenience for other people often get their needs met quicker and because it all costs money unfortunately and it's the same with mental health as well do you know what? Because I'm, I'm conscious that we've gone off onto a different topic and um, we probably should wind down. I'm very conscious that I didn't do my typical thing of who are you, your dedicated interest, when did you discover you're autistic? But that's fine. We've had Tanya on before, so you feel free to go and find out who Tanya is. Um, yep. I've definitely got um, links to your new page, et cetera, group in the yep. description for this video so they can find Tanya. Um but we can finish on what are our favourite stims. Have you got a new one since? So I mean, I'm been... thinking about this. So I do, it's, it, this isn't my favourite. This is just one that I do. Right. So I was thinking about, I saw Melissa, is it Melissa yesterday about singing? And like I literally, so not a lot of people know this about me, but I, I'm actually, I can sing like properly trained. But that's actually also, because if you think about it, you've got interception, you've got audio, You've got the breathing, the control that you have to have. So, yeah, like I'm constantly singing, constantly got music in. Um, kitchen discos are a big thing in my house as well for me and the kids. Anything that's music, we cannot help but move to a beat constantly, rhythmically. Even when my youngest son was like barely moving, he would he would to a beat. He could pick beats out of advert music <laughs> on the TV. But, yeah. So anything like that, really. There was something fantastic in the executive functioning video 
comment the comments yesterday and I can't remember who said it and it was really interesting and they were saying something along the lines of um singing because mm. of it it doesn't use up a certain level of cognitive resources is quite good for people well, it doesn't actually either it doesn't I think so in terms I, of regulating I, think I would be really clever if there was more space in my brain and the song lyrics were taken out <laughs> <laughs> it's literally just full of random like, you know, when I was trying to think of the, the guy who did the female autism phenotype, I got Barry Manilow singing Mandy in my ear. <laughs> to try and remember, yeah. <laughs> but that's how it worked. But yeah, um, yeah, maybe it is. It, it kind of a meditation. It's a stim, isn't it? And and I certainly, although I do have some like physical ones, got a new, I don't think people have seen this before, but you. Oh, that looks nice. It's quite, I just yeah. Get the same amount of satisfaction. It, it's Props. just yeah fingers yeah. yeah i just don't. i do still do stimmies sings singing songs and stimmies in echolasia songs in my head as well and i think it is it's because it helps me it, i usually do it when i'm trying to process so that's the thing back to the attention tunnels isn't it if we get stuck in something whether it's a stim because when we're a stim we get stuck in whatever sense it is that we're in or if we're into our dedicated interests, then it's because we're seeking that out to process. Yeah. And it does, it does, it does help process. It helps Louis also know that I'm trying to process something because he'd be like, okay, you've been singing that song over and over all day. Are you okay? Kind of thing. I think the longest I've kept one for has probably been about two or three weeks, but it'll be the same line because I really like the feel of that on my ears. I, how do you even explain that like, i know and that's the thing you get with it oh yeah. and trisha makes up songs about their cats yeah so yes. i say this when i've described this before is i have some of the same songs that i've been singing at louis for the six years that we've been together and i can never remember them when i'm here because it's something unconscious that i do to when i'm processing or do you know what else I do? So do you know when I'm just like pottering around the house on my own and I'm trying to aid my poor executive functioning um, because I'm talking myself through what I'm doing, I actually sing it to myself. Off we go, get the kettle, get the cup, get the... <laughs> and I literally just probably sound crazy like Cinderella. No, there's so much. There's a lot of science and discussion behind singing. Um, it's actually a fascinating, fascinating Thing that we but do. it's really it's massively meditative for me because I'm thinking about what my breathing's doing, what my body's doing. I'm not having to think about. So I suppose a, a little bit like yoga. Yoga is kind of, you know, um, even like, yeah. in some ways. Okay. But that because you're thinking about what your body's doing and you and everything else, you you processing in the background. Yeah. So you, and you get that interception, and if you demand avoidant like I am, that's you really need that interceptive stim. So yeah. So the breathing regulation is massively interceptive. So yeah. Anyway, everybody. No, should do. <laughs> but yes. Uh, well, thank you so much, Tanya. Um, hold okay. on, I'm going to do me outro tune in a second. Ooh, music. Um, thank you, fantastic people, for being here, and particularly if you've been here the whole time, because this was a particularly long one as well. I will try to get them down to an hour, but I don't know if I'll be able to do that. Um, next week is an. Again, a really interesting topic, um, but there will be some trigger warnings. So the one we're doing next week is autistic parents and the sort of increase in accusation of fabricated and Ooh. induced illness. Yeah. Um, so Tanya knows about this stuff as well, is that potentially because resources are quite finite, um, people who are going to or needing assessment to recognize their young person as autistic, the parents are being accused of um, fabricated and induced illness, which would have in the past been it's, classed yeah. as Munchausen by proxy. Um, and so it's yeah, we're gonna have- changed, Yeah, to perplexing presentations, but literally being an autistic parent is written as a risk factor for abusing your children. And that was written by the Royal College of Pediatri Pediatrics. So, yeah, so we've got Shona Murphy who does work on this research and looks into it and and, and things. So um, she's going to give... I literally work, yeah, I've got, I think, two at the minute, fee cases with autistic parents. Which, it's, given that it's so arguably meant to be a really rare uh, experience or phenomenon, 
but it's not actually a diagnosis it's mm. not a diagnosis it's not in any diagnostic manual it's just a bunch of risk factors that's got absolutely no evidence i think the oh i can't remember his name but the baswer the chair of the baswer the british association for social workers in eight years has found two instances of fee fii where there had been significant harm come to a child and one was because there was something medically wrong with them after all and the other one was suicide yeah so it's it's going to be a very sensitive topic um but it's an important no no it's no it's a sensitive topic but an important one so we've got shona murphy uh, yeah thank you and thank you everybody thank you so much um tanya and um thank you everyone for being here Okay. Have some lovely twangly music for us on the outro. Bye. See you soon. Bye.